from the beautiful sun-kissed island of Kauai, it's Animal Talking. Tonight, join Gary and his guests, Shaggy, Jimmy O. Yang, Jordan Boat Roberts, and Kiki Wolf Kill. And now, because somebody's got to do it, here's your host, Gary Widda. <laughs> Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. It's, uh, it's animal talking, it's summertime, and what better way to kick off the summer than with a little shaggy? What a piece of dilemma! <laughs> Demonic seed supply. Sugar! Girls from near and far I request me banana. Me a the gal them banana farmer. The whole of them a request me banana. Till I come and them no want go. Give them me one time, two time, them want more. Till I come and them no want go. Give them me three times, sometime them want four. Till I come and them no want go. Me have a Latina girl, she named Cassandra. She tell me say she come straight from Colombia. So I me go recommend her my banana. Tranquila mama see that's the manana. That's how we do it. That's how we do it, so we do it, so we do it. Y'all are telling me say the banana sweet. They say the length on the side make them weak. Oh no, see, that's how we do it. That's how we do it, so we do it, so we do it. And them are telling me say the banana sweet. They say the length on the side make them weak. With it, cool, drop. Hey! Feel like come on in our world. They will have them a request me banana Till I come and them no want go Give them me one time, two time, them want more Till I come and them no want go Give them me three times, sometime, them want four Till I come and them no want go Girls from Spain, Sweden, Ghana and Japan I ring up me phone and ask direction Them want come chill from me plantation Two girls from France say them want I miss me Me say we, me say we, me say we Grab me banana and tell me it's we Them say we, them say we, them say we Say la vie I'm a say them, me say them, me say them, me say them, me say them Till I come and when I want go home Sweet, sweet, hot shot Hey Till I come and then I want go home Start the show. What a way to start the show. Shaggy, come join us. Come join us on the couch here as I uh, fire up our uh, fire up our jukebox. Where the hell is my juke control? There it is. I gotta get the gotta get the music. Um, if all has worked and my patient and uh, wonderful staff are as good as I hope they are, Shaggy, live from Kingston, Jamaica, is currently here with us in the chat. Shaggy, how are you, sir? Yes, sir, I'm here. Oh my God. <laughs> I you know what? I love it when a plan comes together. There's so many moving parts to make this show, but like when it actually goes off, I, I just love it. Shaggy, thank you so much for joining us on Animal Talking. What a treat it is to have oh, you here. Man, you have an amazing staff, by the way. Your, your crew is on point. They're, you know, it's funny how they know everything about the screen without, you know, even looking at it. That's amazing. You see, now that's just going to go to their heads. You've done me no favors there at all, frankly. They're going to be going to be impossible to deal with. Um, I got. I do have to give special special credit to my wife Leah, my executive producer, also, and she actually makes the avatars on the show when people need us to do that for uh, uh, for them. And. Um, all, all credit. I think she's done a wonderful job on your avatar. You told me uh, in the pre-interview that your wife actually prefers this version of you to the real thing. Yeah, she says it's cuter. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I have the same problem. My, my this, I mean, this is this is why I like being in this game. I, I have hair. I'm handsome. I'm like completely the opposite as, as I am in real life. This is a much better version. We actually created yours. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. So. Um, 
you're so you are again. This is and this is the magic of the internet, the magic of animal talking. You're sitting here on the couch here on the in the beautiful sun kissed island of Kauai, but in reality, oh. you actually are on your own beautiful sun kissed island right now. You are joining us live from Kingston, Jamaica. Live from Kingston, Jamaica. Man. Oh my God, it, uh, is that like your spiritual home? It is my main home. It's where my uh, wife, kids, and dogs are, and um, and less COVID. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so I, I so I, I have so I have to ask you about that. How is it going over there? Is everyone wearing masks? Are people being sensible? Like, what's everybody, that? What's that whole situation? Everybody's really, really social distancing, and and they're wearing their masks. It's mandatory that anywhere in public you do wear a, a mask. And on top of that, you know, they caught they they jumped ahead of the curve really quick, and they quarantined everyone, set proper curfews, uh, uh, closed businesses. And, you know, they did the whole thing, and they're, I'm very, very proud of them. I, I've been here two weeks, and I'm, you know, my my two week quarantine is up now, but they did an amazing job, and I'm, I'm I feel a lot safer walking around if I was in Florida, for instance. Oh my God! Well, I, I was going to say you're in a much better place than you are than we are right here in the United States. This, this why do you think I do this talk show? I'm not leaving my basement. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I got so I got to talk so I got to talk to you about this this stone cold banger that you opened the show with banana this so, so they sent me some metrics on this on this song this is absolutely crazy um 20 billion billion with a b views on tiktok and it's even sparked something called the banana drop challenge 26.7 million tiktok videos have been created off the back of that song T tell me about the banana drop challenge uh you know it's uh some guys from new zealand man uh, they literally came up with this whole dance and it just went viral. Uh, DJ Flea, who actually took the original track and did kind of a remix, he created that horn drop and they created a dance to that horn drop and that became the viral thing. And it was you know, crazy, it just went nuts on TikTok. Uh, but, you know, uh, to the credit of the song, you know, there's so many songs that go do well on TikTok and don't trans, uh, translate to other formats. And this one has done very well. It streamed well, it shazammed well, and it's now doing incredibly well on radio. And it's been going, uh, we're number one in the Netherlands. And uh, I hear recently we just got another number one again. And so Mexico. literally this this is breaking news, banana breaking news. This just came in like five minutes before we went live. Uh, that song is now number one on radio in Mexico. And you beat, you beat Lady Gaga to take the number one spot. What the hell? <laughs> I know, right? And what's so great is, you know, it's that we're doing this, you know, at the, almost 30 years of career and I'm still here with a whole new generation of young kids and on, on such an, an amazing new platform. And, uh, you know, I'm just very, very, very uh, fortunate and just, uh, you know, just a lot of gratitude. It was pointed out to me during the research for this that you have now had big, major, like number one hits in four consecutive decades, which is, I mean, you know, you, so you're no one hit wonder. I mean, you you know, like Kate, our stage manager, was just fangirling over you uh, and it wasn't me. You know, she grew up well, with that song. What, what, I'm what, most, go ahead. I'm the, I'm the most consistent one in wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just just one hit one one hit wonder after another what what, yeah. what 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 is the secret so many of your songs like they just trip right off the tongue they're really catchy they go they go viral what what is the secret to making a song that goes viral and just stays in the public imagination like that i couldn't tell you what makes it go viral because this is all new to me but i could tell you as far as me making songs i try to do i try to go against the grain I try not to do cookie cutting. I don't like the status quo. I, I'm always a guy as oh, and so that makes it a little harder for me because record companies they really like cookie cutting. You know, they they want to you know, and radio likes that too. So when you come with something that is totally different, um, they tend to not want to play it. But I, for some reason, you know, write these records that are that are um, uh, become infectious and and just kind of just roll. And I've done it many times. And with this one, big up to Conqueror who came with a you know this amazing choke did these lyrics and and took the uh the original um melody from the banana boat song and i heard and i thought it was just amazing i and was I gonna really say like when you're standing on the yeah. shoulders of harry belafonte you're halfway home already yeah. right yeah my brother it's a proven record already you know you know he did a, a, an amazing job um you know converting those lyrics and making them so cheeky and, and i really love that about it so all i did was i just produced a record i went ahead and reproduced the drums and and did the music over and and uh, just gave it a, a, a more more dance all feel to it. And then I, I jumped on it and, and just gave it my best shot. Here we are. 
when you're when you're making you, know, you said earlier that you can't you 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 don't know what necessarily makes like the chemistry of a viral hit but like when you're in the studio and you're recording an album do you have a sense for like oh yeah th this is the one that's going to pop off like do you have a feeling for like which ones are going to be the hits i will know what's special absolutely like when i did Buster bombastic at the time in 1996 when we did it there was nothing on radio that sounded like it and even with old carolina nothing sounded like it or wasn't me when we did wasn't me we we're in the uh, britney spears and insane mode so imagine that you're hearing a record like this you know for the average record person who you know or radio person they're like how the hell does this fit on the radio but you know you have something really special like i felt it wasn't even special because i tried to give it away when my managers and my record company didn't like it i tried to give it away to another artist and i i got a new a and r uh hans hadal and he was a german guy and he came in and says i'm just a white guy here but i think that's a hit and that's how we ended up putting it on the record and it wasn't a single a DJ out of Hawaii played it and it just blew up. But, you know, I couldn't make it a single because the record company didn't couldn't hear that kind of song. But we knew I knew it was something special and I tried to give it away. Same thing with Mr. Boombastic. We fought for these records because we knew it was something special. And with Banana, we knew it was something special. We went ahead. I gave it to Steve, Steve Greenberg, who, uh, you know, he, he did Who Let the Dogs Out. And this record kind of really kind of went in that direction. I called him and I said, I have a record that I think is right up your alley. And I gave it to him. You know, here we are. You, sir, have sold more than 40 million records, Thank which you. is no mean feat. And now, in, I, I guess as a way to celebrate that, you have this new album coming out, Hot Shot 2020, which is the 20th anniversary of the original Hot Shot. I'm going to put a little picture up here on the screen. Here's the, here's the new version, Hot Shot 2020. Here's the album cover. This is Drop. So the original Hot Shot was a diamond. A, I didn't even know a diamond was a thing, but a diamond album, more than 10 million copies sold. And now Hot Shot 2020 is kind of like a revisitation of that coming out on July 10th. So you're re-recording some of your biggest hits. It wasn't me, Angel, O Carolina, Mr. Boombastic. What, what's it been like going back? And oh my God, did, did we just lose someone? What? Why does this happen to me every time, Adam? Why does this happen to me every time? Who 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 dropped connect? I'm sorry about this, Shaggy. My apologies. We have technical problems on this show every which way. I'm just gonna let pe I, I, I'm just gonna let people look at your album cover for a bit longer here as we figure out who the hell. <laughs> Who the hell just kicked us all off the set? Adam, how many how many different like safety procedures do I put in place to prevent this from happening? And nothing nothing's ever good enough. At least well, one. Welcome to I'm, technology. I'm running back. I'm running back. <laughs> We're all now and now and now comes the frantic run back to the set. Everyone's gonna get back to the to the set. This won't be a thing on the YouTube version. Don't worry. It's only it's only for our live audience. And I gotta kill this uh, image for a second here while I get everyone back on the set. Every bloody time, Adam. Was it who was it? Who dropped? Who do I blame? Uh, I just need someone I, to blame. I don't know. I'm sure Kate will figure it out for us and then uh, not tell well, us. I can tell you what. It wasn't me. Oh, it was all worth it for that. <laughs> it was all <laughs> worth it. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Okay, well now, well now 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 we have to keep now we have to keep the whole thing in because that 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 that, that, that gag that gag that's you know what that is that is so and, and shaggy my goodness my hats off to you sir that was so good people are going to accuse us of staging the whole thing just to get to that line that was incredible shaggy tell tell me about hot shot 2020 so you what what you you're revisiting and, the, the, and this isn't just like the old versions like slap back on no. an album you gone went went back in and revisited no. rearranged reapproached these classic songs tell me about that well hot shot itself is a very um a, a remarkable album in, in in the journey of reggae and dancehall music it was the first album that brought numbers to the game you know uh when hot shot happened with angel it wasn't me you know, that brought dance ball in so many different formats. And then, of course, everything kind of snowballed down. And we got Sean Paul and Weenie Wonder and all of these guys that came out after. And um, and we've been doing it since 1993 with uh, Old Caroline, of course, Mr. Boombastic, um, Love Me, Love Me, and all of these big records. Uh, but so this Hot Shot album is a celebration of that journey. You know, and what I did, I took about five of the most streamed songs from Hot Shot. Angel, It Wasn't Me, Love Me, Love Me, Keeping It Real, and the Hot Shot track itself. And I gave them new production. So I did new vocals, new, uh, new production on them. I did that with Old Carolina also. I put, I also put Old Carolina, Mr. Boombastic, Strength of a Woman, Hey Sexy Lady, new vocals and new um, uh, production. I have, I added four new songs. One is with me and Sting called Primavera. And another one is uh, Caribbean Way. And I did over Electric Avenue from Eddie Grant and 
Buckingham Palace from Peter Tosh. And uh, I also added Sting on, on Angel. So it's kind of a, it's a Hot Shot 2020 celebration of the journey of Shaggy and dancehall music, you know, but it's also like the greatest hits in a way. And of course we added, and of course, Banana is on the well, you gotta you gotta have the banana in there. So, uh, July tenth, the album it drops. You're also gonna be on Good Morning America that day, um, uh, doing some uh, some performing some tracks live. Uh, yes, very excited, very excited about that. Um, yes. I know, I know, I know our time is limited, so I just want to pop off a couple of a couple more questions for you before we before we lose you back to the mainland. Um, a lot of people don't know this about you, but this is such a fascinating fact. You are not only a hip, you know, recording artist, but you're also uh, a U.S. Marine who did two tours oh. of duty doing Operation Desert Storm. So first of all, thank you for your service. And I, I, I mean, I guess I, I don't even know where to start with you, but like, just tell me, tell me what, tell me what that was like. Tell me what your experience was like in the service, you know, I, being deployed downrange. What was the whole experience like? You know what? I grew up, I did a lot of growing up in the military. You know, I'm an inner city boy. So when I got to the military, the military taught me a lot about, the, you know, it gave me a lot of discipline, you know, uh, you know, where I could get up early in the morning and do this job that I do, which is music and be awake on every different continent and, and be on time for everything. I got that from the military. The, I, people think that you go to the military to learn to fire a gun. I said, the street taught me that. The military taught me how to balance my checkbook, you know? And uh, I had an amazing time there. I met some really good people, uh, met some bad people too, but overall it was an amazing experience that shaped me uh, to be who I am today. That's absolutely incredible. I also, of course, have to talk to you about your friendship with Sting. As you know, Sting was on the show yeah. last week. He, 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 not only did he perform, he brought his guitar and actually sat here on the couch and kind of and, and, and bashed out some hits for us. It was really a surreal yeah. experience. Now, originally, Sting was, was scheduled to come on a week before you. Oh, sorry, a week after you. And my plan was to ask you, um, Shaggy, how does we okay? So like we've got Sting coming on next week. How do I make? I, I want to be friends with Sting. Like how do I make Sting my best buddy? Well, like I've already done that. Like Sting's now my best friend, having been on the show with me last week. Very very nice man. I think it's because I offered. I, I think it's because I said I would drive him to the airport if he ever needed a ride, and he like latched right onto that one. Um, but t tell me about that. Like, how did how did you? So not your friends. You collaborate. You've done an album together. How did you two meet? Why? How did you hit it off? Like tell me about your friendship with Sting. Funny enough, I spoke to him a, a, a couple hours ago too, because <laughs> we we're we're doing some music. But um, you know, I'm not. I knew Sting. The first time I met Sting was in uh, 19, uh, well, 2004. I jumped on stage with him in Antwerp and uh, um, and did Rock Sandwich. And I've seen him a couple of times after that at a different award show, and you know, we kick it. But Martin Kirsenbaum, who is uh, currently Sting's manager, but he was Sting's A and R. He was my A and R in this school. And uh, Martin had dealt with both of us and knew that. We had a lot in common and thought it would be great. And Martin heard me with a song called Don't Meet Me Wait and says and sent it to Sting. And Sting says, Wow, this is great. And I'm in LA in the studio at Martin and Sting walks in and says, Shaggy is a hit, let's do it. And that studio session was just so amazing. We just laughed more than we laughed more than we actually did the record. And um, wow. it was just it just a friendship that was just born. And we just realized we had a lot in common. Both our wives are in film. Um, you know, we like the same gin. You know, he likes Monkey 47, I like Monkey 47 too. You know, it's the so many <laughs> things that we have in common. And, uh, you know, if, if you want, if you, next time you see Sting, anything you do is one thing a lot of people don't know. He loves crossword puzzles. Okay. Right? A lot of people don't know that. And his favorite dessert is vanilla ice cream. These are all these are all great. Uh, by the way, I love I love the way that you say next time you see Sting, like that's ever gonna happen. I mean, it's very optimistic. <laughs> I do appreciate that. Okay, crossword puzzles, and ne but next time I see him, yeah, crossword puzzles and ice cream. Okay, that that's that's that, that's the, that's the way to Sting's heart. Okay, this is this is all this is all good information. This is this is this is good to know. He was very very complimentary about you, by the way. Um, oh. and he said that you guys have have now formed such a bond and ha and have become such close friends that your that your wives are starting to get a bit worried about. The two of you <laughs> do they have i mean do they have anything to worry about or is this just strictly a bromance <laughs> i think it's strictly a bromance but it, you know uh, his wife is amazing i love trudy trudy is, is is such a champion um you know and and one of my favorite people uh rebecca my wife and, and sting gets along well and she gets along really really well with trudy also you know we vacation together sometimes in places and just have have a, have a ball so it's it's just a lovely union it's it's you know it's family man you know and you know the big thing the biggest thing i got out of that album 44876 we won a grammy we sold well we toured well 
but I, I I gained a friendship that I didn't even know I. You know, I, I, I and musically, I, I got to check out this album because Shaggy and Sting is not. It doesn't necessarily like feel like the peanut butter and jelly combo that like it, it, it almost like. like it, did you yeah. find that your stars were compatible? Yeah, it doesn't read well on paper. People are like what? But <laughs> it really makes a lot of sense because the Police music was a lot of heavily reggae, and um, yeah. that's and, true. And, and uh, you know, songs like Every Breath You Take, songs like um king of pain every little thing she does is magic all those songs were written at golden eye in jamaica right you know and so he has got quite a, a history with jamaica and so when i brought him back to jamaica for the first time to perform it was in front of 20 000 people and he had an amazing time it was a ball you know i, I was just you know really really pleased to be uh, the person to really um bring that forth to him I love it. So Shaggy, I, I know you've got limited time and your plane's going to be leaving very soon. So I'm going to plug the album one more time. Hot Shot 2020 is the album. That's coming yeah. out July 10th. All of Shaggy's greatest hits remastered, reapproached for a whole new uh, generation. Shaggy, thank you so much for joining us on the show. You've been a really great guest. Thank you for bringing your music. You've been wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, Gary, man. All the best, man. And Shaggy! To- Sorry. Right. Shaggy, everyone. Watch <laughs> 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 oh, and, and, by, and by the way, before you go, before you go, I, 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 got, I got to give you credit for that, busting out that it, it wasn't me. Like the, the, whole, the whole technical screw up was worth it for that alone. Like that teed you up so perfectly. You absolutely nailed it, sir. Musical prodigy, 40 years of hit making. Yeah. And on top of that, busting out probably the best extemporaneous joke we've ever had on this show. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, you give the woman access to your villa. Trust us on how you can call your pillar. Oh, amazing. amazing. Oh, my God. What a treat. What a treat. Shaggy, you are welcome back here anytime, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gary. All the best, man. Have Shaggy, everyone. <laughs> Adam, first of all, hello. This is my first time talking to you on the show tonight. Hello, sir. How are you doing? I'm, I mean, I'm doing pretty good. Shaggy was a great guest. I feel like we're off to a good start. He opened with a banger, a summer jam, if ever there was one. And he ended up oh, being yeah. a, ter- a terrific... I mean, I knew he would, but like a great guest. Busted out a, a terrific joke, a clutch joke. What a, what a great yeah, start it, we're, it, we're it, off to here. It would be so tough to follow such an amazing comedian with such an incredible joke. Yes. How could you ever follow that? I mean, I, 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 the only way we could do that, I guess, is, is, is if we were to have like a professional comedian coming on next. <gasps> fortunately, fortunately, um, that's exactly what we have. Uh, our, my next guest is a super duper talented uh, actor, stand-up comedian. You've seen him on shows like Silicon Valley on HBO. You're seeing him right now on um, uh, Space Force on Netflix alongside Stephen Carell and one of the best casts currently on television. Uh, He's also got his very own stand-up special right now on Amazon Prime. Please welcome to the show. I'm so glad to have him. He's such such a great guest. Jimmy O. Yang. Here he is. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Take a seat on the take a seat on the couch. Has oh, anybody done, look at that. that. Has anybody done that move though? I mean, come on. <laughs> no, not the, <laughs> not with move. not with the rose, not with the rose in the mouth like that. <laughs> That's very romantic. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> thank you, thank you. you all man. right. So first of all, let's get the ele- let's get the elephant in the room out of the way. That was you who dropped connection, right? I think so, but it was I. I, I want to blame a producer, and and you yeah, know that's you always know, that's always, that's what I do. That's always a good way to go. But it doesn't Wait. matter because we got Shaggy to say it wasn't me. So I think <laughs> I was actually being a really good guest. Right. So are you gonna are you gonna make the excuse here that your comedic genius was to engineer a scenario that would tee Shaggy up to make that joke? Well, me and my best friend Shaggy worked that whole thing out. So. <laughs> It was it was seamless, you know. As if you guys didn't know that, that that's what we wanted to do. Jimmy, thanks for coming on the show. It's a real treat to have you here. I've been a fan of yours uh, for a while now. Uh, for people who don't 
Uh, I always assume that no matter how famous the guest is, and we've had some pretty big stars on the show, I always kind of assume that people don't know who the guests are. Uh, you're a stand-up comedian. You're an actor. You uh, were originally born in Hong Kong. Your family mm -hmm. moved here to Los Angeles when you were 13 years old. You come to America, you're 13 years old. How do you wind up as a stand-up comedian and an actor? Well, the stand-up thing, I think so many people has great stories. Like, oh man, me and my brother used to sneak in a theater and watch Eddie Murphy five times a week. Um, I didn't even know what stand-up comedy was growing up because that wasn't a big thing in Hong Kong yet. And uh, I remember the first stand-up comedy I saw was uh, BET Comic View on, um, you know, when, on BET when I was about 13, 14 years old, when I first came to America. And it was just like such a fresh art form. And it wasn't just funny. It was like informing me about culture and everything that's, you know, within America, you know. Um, so that was super fun. And after, right when I was about to graduate college with an economics degree, I knew I wasn't about to be like in finance. I just hated every bit of that. So it was a desperation that kind of drove me to stand up comedy. Uh, I wrote this book and uh, in the book I said, Googling local open mics is one step away from Googling what's the best way to kill myself. <laughs> uh, and then I ended up at the Haha ha Comedy Club in um, North Hollywood, where you have to pay $5 for five minutes of open mic, and nobody was really listening. And that's how I started stand-up comedy. I mean, I, I salute anyone who has the balls to, to step up to an open mic and try and make people laugh. Like, I mean, it's just, 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 just the thought of it fills me with dread. Do you, remember, do you remember what your first ever open mic was like? Was it a disaster? Did you bomb? Did you make people laugh? I had no expectations. Obviously, I wasn't going to be Dave Chappelle my first time. You know, uh, any chuckle would have been validating. And and you got to understand, like, I, I didn't have too many friends back then. You know, uh, my life wasn't going the way I wanted. I didn't have a girlfriend. So any amount of attention was good, right? And and, and I remember, I think my uh, first joke was um, just like every comedian. It's about, like, jerking off. And it was a joke about me jerking off to, like, Sports Center by accident. I forgot <laughs> how it went. But the joke was so crude. It got some pity chuckles from other open micers and uh and, and that's how i got my start and it, it wasn't even being on stage that 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 really interested me it was the after show hang i saw other comedians coming up to me you know we're chopping it up and they would give me taglines uh to that jerk off joke i was like okay there's something here this is fun <laughs> it's an art form when, when when in doubt go low and crude right yeah absolutely yeah so uh you start as a stand-up uh now if people who know you Obviously, you, you, you're you doing all kinds of amazing stuff. We're going to show some clips and drop some links in just a moment. Uh, mm. But if people know you from anything, it's as Jin Yang on Silicon Valley. How did I was, well, well, I would say white people know me as Jin Yang. <laughs> Asian people know me from Crazy Rich Asian, so speak for yourself. Dude. Okay, fair enough. All right, you got me. You got me. God, everyone, <laughs> guests, guests are so salty this season. Adam Sting, <laughs> Sting was giving me grief. To be fair, I walked. To be fair, I walked into that that musical trivia match with Sting, and I and I I, I went in like like full chest out, and he just sent me packing. That was a very embarrassing moment for me. Oh wow! Was, yeah, yeah I got I got into a battle of musical trivia with Sting, and he of course knew more than I did, and it ended up like, I, I was. I ended up with egg on my face. It wasn't good. Um, how, sorry, but how did you transition from uh, uh, stand-up comedy to acting? I think once again, I stumbled into it. Um, I moved back to LA from San Diego uh, where I went to college. And um, I was just hoping to get a commercial agent just so I could do some commercials because I heard buddies from the comedy store telling me, man, I was behind Kanye West basically as a bodyguard, as a background in this commercial. And I ended up making SAG and making like 60 grand off residuals. I was like, oh man, that's what I want to do. I want to stand next to Kanye West and do nothing and make money. Um, so it, it was just kind of like a means to an end, like a, like a way to support my stand-up career, which I wasn't getting paid yet. Uh, so I just got signed up to all the LACasting.com actors access, you know, like like all of those things. That's, that's kind of like very generic and, and hacky. Um, and I just put my headshots up there and I just wrote uh, new in town, need an agent, which in hindsight is exactly how you get preyed on. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> like, <laughs> So I, I, I wanted like three different, very small agents, like hit me up. They're like, come meet with us, you know? And I was just an innocent 21, 22 year old kid. Who knows what could have happened? And my first meeting with an agency was uh, with a commercial agency. And I went to Santa Monica, I drove all the way to Santa Monica. And the address was 
an apartment building, just like a 50 unit apartment complex. I was like, oh dude, this is not right. And then I walked in, there was a sign up sheet in the lobby. And then some lady <laughs> ushered me into the audition. And the audition was in the apartment rental office. Like the agent just rented a room from the apartment <laughs> rental office. <laughs> And he had me read some size from a Staples commercial. And apparently I was so bad that apartment rental agency agent never called me back. So now, that was how okay. I started. Okay. So as a white person, I'm a big fan of Jin Yang. Tell me, tell me how you got that, that, that breakthrough role. Cause you know, that, I, and, and also tell me like, did you, I mean, it was in, in, it originally started as a very small role, but I think what happened yeah. was people love that character so much that they began to write more and more for you. Do, do I have that right? Absolutely. Um, it's interesting. I actually auditioned for that role twice. There was a pilot that they wrote, but never shot where I think the, um, the main cast started off successful. They just got a hundred million dollars. And uh, in that script, Jing Yang was a pretty big character. And I auditioned for that. Uh, Jeannie McCarthy's office, great casting director. And then I never got a call back. I was like, ah, you know, too bad, whatever. And then three months later, they started shooting the show. But now the show has taken a completely different direction where it's an underdog dog story of the startup make, uh, uh, trying to make it, right? And Jing Yang is now only in episode three and he only had two lines. Uh, I think it was him opening the door to the guy and he just says that uh, this is Pipe Piper a couple of times and that was it. And I auditioned for it. It was seriously like one take, maybe two. And then that was it. You know, you didn't think too much about it. It's a two line part. And I got, I got called in, I got the job. I was pretty excited. And uh, I really didn't expect it to be anything bigger than that. But I remember after the first day on set, Zach Woods came up to me and I was like, oh, you know, you got something really funny in the next episode. And I was like, what? Next episode? What are you talking about? <laughs> and uh, it was the two, uh, I, I eat the fish scene. And, and I hadn't okay. read the script, but the cast has already. So Zach kind of gave me a tip. And I was just so grateful to be there. And I was getting paid, you know, SAG minimum, which is what, 900 bucks a day. And I ended up being in uh, three episodes in the first season, all a couple of lines, very one-dimensional character, I would say. But I think they always kind of had bigger plans for the Jing Yang character. And uh, I, I guess being an immigrant, I embodied him fairly well. And uh, between season one and two, actually, I was offered a series regular role on another show. So we decided we're like, ah, who knows what a new show is going to do. And Silicon Valley is already getting loved, like with Emmys and everything. We're like, I don't care how small my part is in season two. I should just stay on Silicon Valley instead of doing this other right. show. Um, and let me tell you, between season one and two, I was driving Uber at the time. So that that check to be a series wow. regular on this oh, other wow. show would would have meant a lot but luckily enough we called HBO and they liked me enough to kind of keep me on uh, in the cast and kind of match that series regular deal so from season 2 on i became you know a regular character and they started writing more and more for me and that's when me and TJ really kind of found or uh, kind of Laura and Hardy dynamic. And, and yeah, we had a lot of fun through it. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many times my wife and I have watched those clips of you prank calling Ehrlich. Oh my God. Just the, That's the... one of those things. I mean, <laughs> you as a writer, I, I don't know if you ever feel this way about certain things you've read or you've wrote. That's one of those things that the table read, I read it. I'm like, there's no way this is going to work. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is ridiculous. But then when, when, when I read it at the table, read, everybody was dying laughing. And then when we did it, like, it was hard for me to keep a straight face. So I was like, okay, that was something there, you know? So, um, yeah, it turned out to be one of the more memorable moments of Jing Yang, you know? Now, um, as you mentioned, uh, particularly um, among uh, white people, this really did uh, lead to you getting suddenly much more recognized. You mm -hmm. talked about this on your... Um, stand-up special so I'm, I'm like remind me the name of your because i want to make sure people can go find it what's the name of your stand-up special on amazon yeah my special it's called good deal and it's on amazon prime good deal okay so we're going to show a little clip from it right now and here's a little clip where you talk about uh what it was like after you be after you became famous as jin yang and getting uh recognized on the street so like we're gonna we're gonna roll that clip right now i see a lot of people out here in the streets they want to come up to me but they're not really sure <laughs> There's a lot of debate amongst their friends. They're like, hey man, are you sure that's him? <laughs> if we go up there, we gotta be sure because if we go up there and it's not him, we're gonna look super racist. <laughs> are you sure that's not Ken Jeong? <laughs> I don't know, it looks kind of like Ali Wong, I don't know. <laughs> and they come up to me, it's always like the first thing they say, like, hey, hey man, aren't you that dude Jing Yang from that show Silicon Valley? And I was like, oh, oh thanks, thanks. 
yeah, thank you, thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, I am. And then they're like, oh shit, I didn't even know you speak English in real life. <laughs> like, it's called acting, motherfucker. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, I mean, you and I actually talked about this a little bit um, when we did our pre-interview. You obviously speak English way better than, than Jin Yang does. Did, in order to kind of capture that, that kind of broken English, did you, like, were you, did you feel like you were able to regress to like an earlier version of yourself when you were still learning English? Or, or is it just acting? Like, how did you, how did you capture that, that version of Jin Yang? Both, right? Because so much acting is drawing from your own experience of people around you. And I still definitely have uh, relatives that talk that way. So I try to do like a very authentic uh, mainland Chinese accent based on a lot of my Shanghainese folks. It's, uh, you know, it, it wasn't like a just generic um, what people think like a Bruce Lee accent would be, right? Right. So I just try to make it as specific as possible and make the character as grounded as possible, even though he's kind of, a, you know, a, 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 it started off as kind of a broad character, you know? Um, so yeah, I just drew a lot from my experience. And till today, I think I still have somewhat of an accent. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, that was uh, that was a fun exercise. I was very comfortable in Jing Yang's shoe. So now between Crazy Rich Asians and... Uh, Silicon Valley, which were kind of like in the same time frame. What, did you feel like mm -hmm. there was a moment where you suddenly blew up and you were like, I don't need to drive Ubers anymore. Like this, is, I, I can do this now. Like, was, <laughs> there, was there like a tipping point moment where you felt like you had made it or broken through to the other side? Well, when they made me a series regular in season two, money wise, that was like an I made a moment. I wasn't getting paid a lot, but I was getting paid more than $900 an episode. Uh, so I didn't have to drive Uber anymore. I could go get my own apartment. So that was a huge moment. Um, and Crazy Rich Asians was a was a big moment where um, not even just for my career. Yeah, of course, it helped my career, but it was a huge watershed moment, I think, for the Asian community. So I think ever since then, uh, uh, Asian actors, Asian creators, Asian writers has gotten a lot more opportunities because that movie proved that, you know, we could be front and center. We could carry a whole movie and uh, uh, we, we, we do have a diverse group of talent you know, in front of the scene and behind the scenes. So that, that, that's been a huge moment. And um, a lot of scripts that I was writing, uh, uh, stuff that I wanted to produce, stuff like that, that all started to um, catch on a little bit, uh, not just for my own personal success, but uh, success as a whole for the community uh, and the whole representation, um, you know, uh, conversation. So, so, so that was really, really nice. And personally, I think doing that movie, because usually when you're an Asian actor, you you almost always the only Asian dude or girl on set. Um, but with Crazy Rich Asians, I really felt like I found my creed because we all came from different backgrounds. We all had parents that wished that we were uh, uh, doing finance, lawyer, doctor. Uh, so we all went through that struggle, but you know, we all kind of made it to some point. And those guys, all of those guys, they're still some of my best friends. And, and I really felt like I found my creed um, and I found my lane, you know, through doing that movie. So I would say personally, uh, that, that, that was a huge moment doing crazy. And now I got to talk to you, of course, about Space Force, because that's where we can currently mm. find you on Netflix. The story, I mean, before we even get to your part in the show, the story of the show as someone who works in Hollywood and is developing material all the time and, know, and, and knows how long it can take. The, mm -hmm. the, the way in which this was made at like light speed is kind of amazing to me. So the Trump administration announced its latest harebrained scheme which is some kind of cockamamie you know air force in space they yeah. announced the space force and then the next thing you know netflix announced okay okay they've announced a show right off the back of it i get it but then almost immediately after that the show's like on the air like this thing seems like it was made at warp speed did it feel that way to you yeah, I think so. And and I mean, that's the power of Greg Daniel, Steve Carell and Netflix, you know, when when those three uh, 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 things get together, they can just make something incredible in a short amount of time. And and Steve is also a writer on the show. Uh, uh, you know, all of them are just so creative, like all of them, like the writer's room is Greg Daniel, Steve Carell. Brent Forster, uh, Paul Lieberstein. Like these are the people that has made TV show for us for like the last 20 years. Yeah, the comedy uh, credentials are pretty legit, right? It's pretty insane. And for me, I'm just uh, completely in all of them. And, and it's just a great learning experience, you know? And um, yeah, I, I, I think in, 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 in the generation part of it, they're such professionals. Like when I'm sitting in the writer's room listening to them, uh, it just, they know what they're talking about. It's almost like a, a brilliant shorthand of what things might be. And uh, I wasn't there in the first season of the writer's room. Um, 
and 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 I'm sitting in a little bit uh, for the hopefully a second season. So it's great to see those guys work, and and I'm sure yeah they absolutely killed it, and and that was the reason why they were able to make it that fast. Um, we're going to show a clip in just a moment. Netflix were kind enough to send us a clip. It's a super mm. nerd. Like what I love about it is like a, such a nerdy clip. I love it. Um, but tell me, tell me how the role came to you and tell before we roll the clip, tell me, tell us a little bit about the character you play on the show. Yeah. So I play Dr. Chan, Chan Kai Fong on the show. And he's also an immigrant, doesn't have an accent, uh, but he's a scientist. So he's definitely something uh, more honorable, someone more honorable than Jing Yang. Uh, he is John Malkovich's right-hand man. And actually, that part didn't start that big either. I was developing my own show uh, for another network at that time. And I didn't, you know, this is right after Silicon Valley. I was very fortunate to have landed this role in front of, uh, I auditioned for Craig and everyone else. You know what, um, funny story. I actually auditioned for uh, Ben Schwartz's role first. I, I, I auditioned for F. Tony's role. And then they're like, um, <laughs> Actually, you know, there's this other role that I think uh, you're really good for. So and then they just offered me the Dr. Chan role, which I think is perfect because I think Ben Schwartz is so perfect for the F. Tony role. Um, but yeah, I, I, I didn't expect it to become like a series regular. I'm in every episode role. Uh, but I think Greg, who has worked with Mike Judge on King of the Hill, called Mike and got a good review from Mike. It's like, yeah, this guy's good. Pick him up. So um yeah, and, 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 you know, I just try to stay active. I just try to be a valuable member of the team, you know, whereas it's pitching, you know, little story ideas or just just showing up, you know, uh, well prepared every day on set. So that role kind of grew bigger, too, um, with the whole romantic storyline that sets up, you know, uh, me and Tani later on in the season, not to give too much away. Uh, that was something, you know, we went into the room and pitched and, and they're just so open minded, you know, to let us kind of have our idea. So that was really fun and rewarding. I'm going to show this clip in just a moment, but you brought up John Malkovich and uh, you, you, you obviously you've done a lot of stuff, Jimmy, but like you're still relatively new at this kind of showbiz mm -hmm. game. When you first walk onto the set with John Malkovich, I know you're a professional, obviously, but like you've got to be nerding out a little bit. Not, not just nerding out, man, but just like nervous, like, <laughs> like, to, like, like, oh my God, that is John Malkovich dude like um and steve carell man i mean and my mm. first day shooting was a scene with those two. Oh my but god the thing is <laughs> i wonder if they, they do that the... deliberately just to throw you in at the deep end <laughs> i know right but they were the nicest people on the planet and steve literally like is the nicest guy in hollywood i think and john is just a cool dude like he actually is very young at heart and he knows more about k-pop than i do um and he's just so open-minded so there's something really cool hanging out with those two and um now i mean I don't know about you and Sting or you and Shaggy, but I can say, you know, Steve and uh, John, they're like real friends, you know? So that, that's really nice. Are, are, are you are you, are you you saying that uh, you don't think I'm real friends with Sting and Shaggy? Because I've got the receipts. I can prove it. I've got clips of Sting <laughs> yeah. saying, Gary, you are my friend. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I've got yes, witnesses. Sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry about yeah. that. Sorry. All right. Okay. Sorry. It's a very sen sensitive subject for me. All right. Let's demand um... <laughs> that they say it either. I, 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 yeah, to be fair, I did kind of force it out of it, but he said it. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. The circumstances are <laughs> relevant the fact is that he said it um jimmy i'm going to show a little clip from um uh space force here let's go to uh monitor two and i again i just love love the uh the outright nerdiness uh of this mm. clip here we go it's the same show just two different names no one is full metal alchemist one is full metal alchemist brotherhood two different shows right so like one's a sequel okay i got it no it's parallel they're like uh Alternate dimensions. What, like one of them's a dream? Full Metal Alchemist came first, but it caught up to the manga, so they have to make up their own stuff. Brotherhood came after the manga. Okay, but which one has Batman? What are you talking about? Oh. Mm. Do not mansplain anime to me, you rude, rude bitch. I can't wait to get rid of you. Really? Is that why we've taken like 20 right turns in a row? Uh, 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 construction detour. You have kidnapped a woman so you can yell at her about cartoons. How dare you? I love it. I love this show. <laughs> uh, is that so? Is so that the, is, 
Is that the is that the rom the romance that you hope is going to develop? Yeah, uh, I hope so. Um, we'll see. You know, it's in the very early stages, uh, and and but you know, I I think what I went in and pitched them was that you know statistically, sadly, uh, Asian men and black women are the least likely couple. But actually, you know, they actually have uh, meetup groups and everything because when they do meet and and start dating each other, it's like the most uh, uh, some of the most successful pairings. So I just pitched that to them, and they actually wrote that into an episode. This whole B Wham, it's called B Wham, Black Women for Asian Men. <laughs> okay. So you know, and, and and it's so cool. You know, I I even talk about this in my stand up that if I know a girl is in the anime, I'm in. You know what I mean? Like like she's probably into an Asian brother. You know, so so that's something <laughs> that's kind of true to life that I want to explore because it's kind of niche also. And we just don't really talk about it. But you know, as as you know, as a great writer, you know, the more specific you are, the funnier you are. And uh, so I, I I I'm really enjoying um, kind of exploring that relationship with my character and Tony Newsom's character down the line. And all credit to the writers as well. Like you can't fake that mm. shit. Like a whole scene about the difference between Full Metal Alchemist and Brotherhood. Like that's you you know that's a legit nerd writing that scene. Like you can't you would never see that on the Big Bang Theory. Like those weren't legit nerds writing that show. Yeah. Like this this feels like you've got really nerdy people on this show <laughs> yes that full metal alchemist stuff i didn't pitch that that was uh our writer uh uh maxwell theodore vivian and he just killed it and so specific and it's lovely i have to go back and watch all two versions of those uh it's great i gotta I, I might pull some of the same shit that i pulled with sting last week because and here's the thing you mentioned you're into anime i i've mm -hmm. never really been a big anime guy but recently i got stuck sucked into these two shows that are both completely batshit crazy and i'm desperate to talk to people about them but i don't know anyone else that's really into anime so you tell me first of all do you know this show one punch man yeah love, love oh my one god that show man. is nuts yeah. in the best way yeah. it's so awesome yeah he's depressed because he's so good i love it i love it <laughs> and and then the other one that i recently got sucked into and this show is just so off the charts nuts like i just have to talk to someone about it you ever seen this show attack on titan I think so. Yeah, yeah. That's a really popular one. Yeah. Oh my God. It's like, it's basically the walking dead, except the zombies are like 200 feet tall. Like it's absolutely insane. Yeah. Yeah. I love the scale of imagination of like, right? Japanese cartoons. And that's what I grew up with. I, I didn't even call it anime to us. That was just cartoons. There was no difference between Dragon Ball Z and, uh, you know, Tom and Jerry. That, that was just a cartoon. Uh, it's funny that Americans, uh, it's a subcategory of uh, anime uh, because that seems a little more exotic. You know, right, um, right. For me, that that just uh, kids shows and cartoons that I grew up watching, and so good. Yeah, like shit that nuts, like shit that nutty never comes out of the West, right? If you want to see like two hundred foot tall zombies and people flying around them with like gas powered grappling guns, like stabbing them in the back of the neck, like you're mm -hmm. only gonna get that like out of something like anime, right? Like Tolly would, would would never do stuff that mental, except when an anime is a big hit and then they want to make like the big live action westernized version of. Yeah, I mean, I think that will. Um... Uh, uh, they were making Akira. I don't know if they're still doing it. I don't you know, know I worked on it. it. You no, you did. Yeah, a, a more more than ten years ago, I actually wrote a script for the live action version of Akira at Warner Brothers, and it never went anywhere. And I remember thinking, ah, uh, you know, maybe I screwed this up. They're, they've since had like twenty five different writers on it, and they still haven't figured out to, how to make it. So I'm like, you know what? Maybe it wasn't me. Maybe it's just yeah. Really hard. Because I know the recent version, my buddy Galunko worked on it, a uh, great Asian writer. And um, I don't know, I think it was Taika Waikiki. I don't, I don't know. And yeah, then, and it, then it kind of never happened. Yeah, They've had I, I so many directors happened. and so many writers come and go on that movie because it's really, really hard. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to adapt. Um, what was your version, if you don't mind sharing? Because, I mean, it's interesting. I don't know if I'm remembering this right, but the original version, it seems like there was like four or five acts like the original anime. We originally planned to do two different movies because we were actually, we, we weren't right. adapting the uh -huh. anime. We were going back to the original Otomo manga, like the massive manga, six volume right. manga, uh, which is quite different than the anime. And I, I don't want to get into it. It's kind of a pain. Like, you know, it's hard when you work on something for a really long time and it doesn't get made. Like you just yeah, kind of want to forget about it. But yeah, we, yeah. We, we came up with a way into it that I think actually 
kind of retained a lot of what was culturally important about Akira, but still making it palatable to like a more global audience. I mean, we, you know, we took a crack at it. And like I said, like when they eventually let us go, I was like, yeah, we screwed up. But then watching, mm. watching so many writers come and go and still fail to get it to a point where they would actually make the movie. I'm like, yeah, maybe, maybe they, maybe they should, I, I, and I'll, I'll make a prediction right now. They'll never make that movie. You'll never see that. Mm. You'll never see that. You'll never see like the big Hollywood live action Akira. If I'm wrong, I'd love to see what they do, but like, if if they were gonna crack it, they would have cracked it by now. Yeah, yeah, oof, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it's a yeah, tough it's one. Tough. Um, tell me about your book, How to American. Yeah, so this book I wrote it came out a couple years ago. Uh, still very dear to my heart, and I do want to adapt it to a TV show. That was the show I was working on, still working. And um, it's just something. Well, you know, originally I was like, maybe I want to write a book. I just want to get all these stories out. That's not quite in stand up format. Uh, you know, and I just want to get it out. And I think a book is a great medium. And I was really enjoying uh, the beginning of my writing. Career. Um, but you know, at first I was like, I'm, I was 30 years old when, when I was starting to write the book, I was like, nobody's gonna want to listen to an autobiography of a 30 year old. Like what have I done? Nothing. You know? So I started to, because I was so insecure, I, I, I tried different ways of selling the book. I try to make it like a self-help book, but it's like a joke and blah, blah, a couple different ways. But then I realized there hasn't really been a lot of stories out there that's like an authentic, you know, immigrant story um, uh, uh, that has made it, you know, in America and Hollywood, which is like the most American thing possible. Um, and then I started thinking about uh, 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 what brought me here and the, the kind of mental battles I have to go through. Really thematically, it's, it's you know, I have to go against my parents like, like it's, it's walking a fine line between being, am I Chinese or am I American? Because the Chinese culture is you listen to your family, you know, whatever your dad says, your mom says, that is to go and they reward that. Whereas American culture is they reward independence. Uh, if, if, if you go rebellious, you become an actor, you become a stand up and you become a rock star. So it's two very different conflicting thoughts. And I came here in such a formative year when I was 13 years old. So it, it was always just kind of tearing me both ways. So I thought, oh man, if I just share this story um, uh, uh, very um, honestly, I think that hopefully will be an audience out there. Uh, whereas it's other Asian kids, other immigrants, or just people that felt like they haven't fit in in their life uh, could could find this relatable. And uh, luckily the book did pretty well. It wasn't a New York Times bestseller or anything, but um, people that has read it uh, has resonated with it a lot. And I pull some of the stories from the book uh, into my stand-up special later on. And at the same time, you know, I'm trying to make that into a meaningful TV show. So we'll see. I love that. Um... Tell me about your life. We, oh, by the way, we did just drop the link, uh, the Amazon link to the book in the chat. If anyone oh, wants to go, that's, that's the nice thing about being on this talk show. Is like you can go plug your book on Jimmy Fallon, but then then, then people have got to go like find the book. Here we can just like yeah. give you a link right away. You're probably selling books like as we speak. They're racking up those sales on Amazon. Jimmy, what are the re the reason why we found you on the show is because you do. I mean, like our our, our favorite kind of guests are those people who actually do genuinely play and love Animal Crossing. You know, for Sting and Shaggy, we love yes. having them on the show, but they're not gamers. We had to create avatars mm -hmm. for them. But this is your this is your real life uh, in-game avatar that you brought onto the show here. We flew flew you in from your own island. Tell me this about- my guy. Here he is, give us a little twirl. Oh yeah, look at that, I love yeah, it. Yeah, I got a little, little like fanny pack. It's almost like an off-white fanny pack. It looks like a know? banana. He's killing it. Can keep his <laughs> shaggy, <laughs> the shaggy theme going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a cute little boy. Have you been have you been a gamer your whole life? Tell me when you first got into video gaming. I have, man. It was when my brother, uh, I have an older brother and he's always like the cool kid. And he convinced my parents to buy us um, a PlayStation 1. And back in Hong Kong, you could hack into a PlayStation 1 where you can play like the bootleg copy discs. So that's what we did. And we had every single game on the planet, man. And um, a lot of sports games, you know, we got real competitive with it. Uh, and also on the computer, um, me and a lot of my relatives and my brother started playing Heroes of Mind and Magic, which oh is like the, the most uh, uh, nerdy game as a turn. Very game. nerdy. Yeah, I still love it. And, um, you know, uh, we started playing uh, Age of Empire, all of those, like, you know, uh, uh, that Ooh, that's Red, Red Alert, right? Uh, Ooh, all, all, yeah. all oh, I games. loved Red Alert. Those but Tesla those coils. Games, 
Yeah. Oh my God. That was that was how I was introduced to Tesla way before Elon Musk was in Red Alert. <laughs> um, but those games always stressed me out because it was so like in real time. If you screwed up a mouse click, you're done. That's why I kind of liked Heroes of Might and Magic, and now you know Animal Crossing, where it's a little chill. Like if you screw up, you're not gonna like your avatar is not gonna get shot. Tell me about your Animal Crossing life. Is this the first Animal Crossing game that you've played? Yeah, I never played the original one. And um, what, what, and what about this one? You know, a lot, of, a lot of you know, there's been a lot of press uh, going around about how like this was the perfect kind of quarantine lockdown game. The world sucks right now. Everyone's stressed out, so they love the yeah. idea of retreating to this you know kind of bucolic island where you can chill out. And the worst thing that can ever happen to you is you get stung by a wasp. Has that <laughs> been part of the appeal to you, like a place to just kind of relax? Absolutely. I always like to have two kinds of games uh, in my repertoire. Uh, I like to have an action-packed game like uh, Halo, or right now I'm playing Overwatch. Oh yeah. Um, you know, and then a chill game where it's, it's playing just uh, offline in Madden or offline in FIFA because online those things are too competitive. Right. Or you know, uh, Mario Odyssey, Zelda, and I finished both of those games. I think I almost got 100% complete on those games. And then Animal Crossing came out pandemic. And it was the absolute perfect chill game for me after, you know, because you want to switch between the two. You, you can't, I can't go to sleep right after I play Overwatch. So, uh, right. This is you need something to unwind to. Yeah, unwind and a nice like palate cleanse. We're playing The Last of Us Part <laughs> Two right now, my wife and I. Let me tell you, that's the last game you want to play before you go to bed. <laughs> Bro, I can't, I cannot do zombies. Like anime zombies, I'm okay with. I cannot do Breaking Bad. I can't do like Last of Us. Like it really right. freaks me out. Yeah. Right. I yeah, always think if, if there's a real zombie apocalypse, I'm just going to shoot myself in the head. Like there's, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling you right now. I don't know why I clapped for that. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything in particular you're uh, looking forward to game wise? We've got the next gen consoles just around the corner. Yeah, I think Overwatch 2 is about to come out, right? With those next, yes. gen, next gen consoles. And you know what? Um, I'm not just saying this because of uh, your next guest, but like, I, I love Halo. Like, that's what I played literally like four or five hours a day when I was in college, Halo 3. Oh, wow. Um, so I do want to get back into that. So maybe I'll wait for the next gen of it to come well, out. Well, you know, Kiki, who's coming on later on the show, I, she runs all of the Halo TV shows and movies. So we should get you in a Halo show or something. I ooh, I would love to. I would love to do some voices, something. For all right, I'm gonna con I'm gonna connect you guys after the show. We'll get we'll get some Jimmy O Yang in the, into the Halo universe. Yeah. Fun fact: John Malkovich was in one of the Call of Duty. So I just was he well, really? Was he really? Yeah, yeah. They animated him. I mean, he was like fully John Malkovich. Uh, it was very cool. Interesting, interesting. Um, okay, so I got, I got to, sh I got to show this other. You, uh, 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 Amazon were kind enough to give us not just one, but two clips from nice. um, from Good Deal, your your stand up special. By the way, if one of the mods or if somebody would like to post, I'm not sure if you how this works, but I think you can post a direct link uh, to um, to stand up special on Amazon Prime if someone wants to do that. But I'm going to go ahead right there, do my little mute the jukebox. Go over to monitor two, and we're going to show another clip from Jimmy's uh, stand-up special called uh, Good Deal on Amazon Prime. Oh, hold on. Wait a second. No music. No music. How do I get this back? Where did the music go? Oh, it's muted? Oh, there it is. Sorry. Oh, my God. Technical, technical problems. Okay, this, this time <laughs> we got okay. it. This, this time it's we got okay. it. I don't want to buy a house. I live by myself, and I'm scared of ghosts. <laughs> I've seen enough movies to know that ghosts only haunt houses. Not one bedroom apartments. <laughs> yeah. I've seen enough Hollywood movies to know that ghosts only haunt rich people's houses in the suburbs, preferably with a newborn baby. Because they got way too much to lose. Shit is high stakes. I live by myself. I ain't got nothing to lose. A ghost come haunt me, I just move. <laughs> worst come to worst, I lose my security deposit. Fuck it, you know? <laughs> What's a ghost gonna do? He's gonna follow me from unit to unit. <laughs> Start knocking on my life fixtures and shit. I'm like, hey, dog, go ahead. It's not my mind. <laughs> you fuck around, we both get evicted, okay? Like, <laughs> you don't want to be a homeless ghost. <laughs> Jimmy, I love you. I love your stand-up. How long? And I'm fascinated by the craft 
of stand-up. Mm-hmm. How long does it take you to do, you know, like, take me from that first open mic that you did and jerking off to Sports yes. Center and all that stuff to having, you know, and then you have to develop like a good, like a, you know, a five minute set and then, you, and then eventually like a whole hour in front of a big audience. Like, what is that evolution like in the craft of, of stand-up comedy? It, it does actually, it took me 10 years and I think you talk to any comedian, Bill Burr or whoever, your first special always takes about 10 years for you to be truly ready for an hour. It's really, really difficult to do an hour because time becomes very slow when you're on stage. Your first five minutes is very long. Your first 15 minutes is very long because, you know, you got to be joke, 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 joke. There's some comedians that tell more stories. And I think in my standup, I have, you know, a couple longish stories that's more personal and less funny. Um, uh, but to do just jokes for an hour, it's quite tough. And even now, if I were to write another stand-up special, it would take me a year or two to really fully dedicate myself to write it because it's not just writing on a page, right? It, there's no other way to get better at stand-up or to hone your craft but to perform in front of a live audience. You cannot do it in front of a mirror. That's not going to work. It's timing, the cadence, and uh, even, like, I'm fairly still, like, I guess uh, I've done it for 10 years, but not the longest time. People that's done it for 30 years, 40 years, they're real masters. Uh, if you see Kevin Hart and he's doing his set at the comedy store to test out some new jokes, some of those new jokes ain't going to be funny. You know, we can still think some jokes are super funny in our head, but until you try it in front of an audience, you, you just don't know. So it has to be a huge trial and error. And for this show, of course, I've been building my material for 10 years. I've been writing, rewriting. But in order to really do it, I dedicated about three, four months of my time just touring every weekend, five to seven shows every weekend, different cities, testing it in front of different crowds, different ethnicities, different demographics, and um, eventually writing, rewriting, and reordering the structure of the special uh, in order to make it work. What do you want to do with your career? Do you want to lean into acting? Do you want to lean more into stand-up? Or do you want to try and balance the two? Like, what are your long-term, what's your long-term ambition? I want to do it all, baby. (laughs) Um, You know, I think stand-up is really fun and that's always my first love. I would love to do it. But like I said, it's just so time-consuming. And I don't want to just dabble. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to give you a fucking great special, you know? (laughs) So it'll be great if, like, say, four months of the year, I focus on that, and then I go shoot a couple movies, and if I can, you know, my off time, develop, produce, uh, write some stuff, and also eventually down the line direct some things, I think that'll be really cool. I I think that's the great thing about this industry is, um, uh, uh, you know, once you get some kind of movement in your career, uh, you get a shot to do other stuff, and, and, and that's what keeps it interesting. You know, because I think every job is exciting. I, I I don't care if you work at McDonald's. The first two months working at McDonald's, it's exciting because everything's new. You're meeting new people. You're learning. You're growing. That's what's exciting about it, right? But then it gets stale. And the great thing about, you know, being in the entertainment industry is there's just so many different lanes. Every movie uh, that I write or play is a different adventure. Uh, every set that I do is a little different. And then from, you know, stand up to acting, to writing, to maybe even producing, directing, that's once again, another uh, uh, direction. So if I can kind of switch between um, uh, a few of these things that I truly all love, uh, I think that'll be just very exciting if they keep letting me do all this. I know we've only got you for five more minutes before your uh, plane leaves back to the uh, island, uh, to the mainland, courtesy of Dodo Airlines. I've got two more questions for you. Um, First of all, for anyone who is, and it's my apologies because Adam did give me a new one. I forgot to plug it into the stream. But anyone who tries to go to Funny Asian Dude on Twitter is going to get a blank page because you were on Twitter and now suddenly you're not. You, You walked away. You're a stronger better man than me jimmy what what compelled you to finally walk away from twitter and how and how, and how can convince me to do the same because I, I i toy with this idea all the time well first of all i got a tiktok and that's way more fun uh, <laughs> and not a lot of people talking shit on tiktok it's just it's just all love and fun right uh so so that's been great and i still use my instagram but i feel like twitter is just the the risk reward is not is not um worth it it's not that I tweet crazy shit. Uh, uh, it's not even like I'm afraid to get canceled. I'm sure everyone has a little bit of that. I, I don't think I'm pretty clean. I don't really have anything that would get me in trouble. 
But to think of good Twitter jokes, it's a full writing gig. I don't have the time and bandwidth for that. Uh, just tw tw for... Twitter comedy is an art form all of its own. Yeah, like some people like Rob Delaney killed it, you know, and, 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 and really did really well on that. I'm just not that type of guy. I would rather use my energy and focus to write a script or write something for my stand-up. Uh, because that that has never been my forte, and I've never been like a super political person on my social media. Um, so it's not like I'm 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 uh, tweeting very uh, <clears throat> um, you know one sided or bipartisan partisan stuff that will rile people up that will get you a million of followers, millions of followers. My stuff is so vanilla. It, there's just no point, you know. Uh, right. It's just a waste of time. So I, I had moved on, and now I'm into still into Instagram, and I've moved on into TikTok. So, I mean, Adam, we, we got to get on TikTok. I feel like we're missing a trick here. Shaggy's on TikTok with like 50 billion, quazillion views or whatever it is. Jimmy, what do, what yeah. do you do? What, what do you do? Like, what, if we go to find, like, first of all, where can we find you on TikTok? And, and if we go there, yeah. what, kind, what kind of stuff are we going to see? Yeah, TikTok and Instagram, it is at Funny Asian Dude. Right. And, um, you know, so uh, with the TikTok account, <clears throat> I just want to try it out because everybody's like, yo, you should get on. This is like the early days of Instagram where you can actually get, you know, get up there. Um, and there's just a lot more organic views on TikTok. Uh, so it's very encouraging, like, especially for newer content creators. So I actually got on there when my stand-up came on and I just re-uploaded some of the clips that Amazon uploaded and it started getting a lot of traction. It's like 500 views here and there, a million views here and there. And then like two days ago, I just posted an old video of me and Blake Griffin playing basketball. Uh, and it, it started just to get a lot of views and, and it's just something cute, 15 seconds, uh, not a lot of heavy lifting. Um, it's just fun, man. So it's it's everything. It's my stand. I haven't started doing the dances. Yet. So for that's, now, that's got to be the next step, right? The next evolution. I, I'm about to do that shaggy banana. You got to do the you got to do the banana yeah. drop challenge. Get on there. I'm very ready. Yeah. So right All now, right. I just stand up and just fun videos and cute videos on my dog. Oh, and cooking videos. I've been getting into a lot of that during. The okay. Pandemic, and I'm loving it. Yeah. Uh, I know your plane is warming up on the tarmac as we speak. We've only got you for about one more minute, but uh, so uh, let's just sum up. Space Force on Netflix. Uh, obviously, Silicon Valley is still streaming on, on HBO. You can go watch the whole thing there. Crazy Rich Asians. How to American, the book on Amazon. Good Deal, the stand-up special on Amazon Prime. What What's, ne what, what's the immediate next thing we're going to see from you? I'm writing a couple of things uh, uh, that I think I'm getting very excited about. We'll see. Um, but, you know, right now, obviously, we can't really go back on the road. So, But I'm very excited to tour again after this first special to kind of share the love with the people in the live audience uh, when things, you know, do get safer and open up. But right now, I'm just kind of in a nice creative phase. Uh, so hopefully, soon enough, you might see uh, How to American as a TV show. Oh, I love that. Amazing. We'll I love that. Um, uh, Jimmy, uh, uh -huh. were you aware that the Command and Conquer Red Alert was remastered and is now out as well? Oh yeah, it's been. Oh no way, is it, it on Steam? It, or yeah, it's on, yeah, Steam yeah, it's on Steam, and it got a man. big glow up. Oh dude, I'm gonna download it and waste my life away. Oh my god, <laughs> it's gonna be great, Jimmy. Uh, I know this is your hard out. Your flight is waiting for you on the tarmac right now. You've been a delightful guest. Thank you, thank you so much for coming thank on the show. You, uh, ne the, the next time you've got something to plug, you're welcome back here anytime, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. And uh, let me just exit with uh, the same look that I can. Oh, I love it. I love it. The romantic <laughs> rose between the teeth. Jimmy O. Yang, everyone. Thank you so much. Give it up for Jimmy. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Hey, Adam, I think the show's going pretty good so far. Yeah, I think it's going really well. We've had two great guests already. Shaggy was a, was a treat. Up. Jimmy was a delight. And now, coming up now, ne very, uh, next on the show, uh, we got something a little bit special. Um, as you know, Adam, you know this better than anyone. And by the way, we we got to we got to find a way to get on TikTok. It's where all the cool kids are at. We got to yeah, get on. They, we got to get on there. I keep hearing it. TikTok this. TikTok that. We'll see. I mean, I feel like I'm about 30, 30 years too old to be on TikTok, <laughs> but we got to get on there. Um, here's what I'm excited about next. As you know, Adam, again, you know this better than anyone, but anyone watching the show knows that uh, Danny Trejo, who is one of our favorite guests on season one, we loved having him so much, and he loved being on the show so much, and he loves playing Animal Crossing so much, that he stuck around and actually became our, he literally is in the end credits of our show now, special correspondent, Danny Trejo. 
And we started this segment called Danny's Diary, where, Adam, you fly over to his island, which is called Treos. And mm -hmm. he takes you around and introduces you to his neighbors. And you just get a little, you just get to hang out with, Adam, I think you actually have the best shot, job on this show. You get to hang out with Danny on his island and just have the, the, yeah. the best time. You're right. So the first episode of the show um, was a big hit. Uh, went viral on YouTube. Uh, lots and lots of media coverage. People just loved seeing Danny, uh, you know, the, the biggest tough guy in Hollywood, suddenly wandering around like catching fish and chasing butterflies and collecting butterflies in his pockets and having these very sweet and wholesome interactions with all his adorable <laughs> animal friends. Um, we are doing how many of these we'll do. I don't know, but the point is, it wasn't just a one-off. We are very. I'm very very pleased. I'm going to mute the jukebox right now to make sure that I don't forget to do it. But I'm very very pleased to be able to debut on the show tonight on Animal Talking, the second episode, the full second episode. We teased just a quick 30 seconds of it last week, but we've got now, and this is even bigger and better than the first episode. This is this is a, a really special treat uh, for me, and I think everyone who's a fan of uh, Danny uh, and, his, and his animal friends. Um, without further ado, without further ado, I am going to introduce you uh, right now as I go over to Monitor 2 to the next episode, the second installment. Here we go. Hold on, let me just get my, my buttons in a, in a row here. It's the second installment of Danny's Diary. Nice to see you again, Danny. I see you've been fishing. I got a whole pocket full of stinky fish. At least this time it's fish and not butterflies, right? Well, we got those too. We got like stinky butterflies now. Mm. More butterflies. <laughs> yeah, you weren't kidding. Been keeping a lot of stuff. <laughs> oh my that was God. another butterfly. Mm. Mm. Thank you. You should try on that hat. <laughs> it's a ice cream cone hat. <laughs> it doesn't look like anything else, right? Is, are we being censored? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I'll show you what I'm fishing. Try to keep up. Whoa, here it is right here. Hold on. Uh, come on. It's a tough one. Here. Ah. Ooh. Oh, man. Just hold it steady. Here it goes. He's nibbling. Oh, my first try. Ah, he got it. <laughs> oh, you got a surfboard. Oh, yeah. A surfboard and a towel in case you want to sunbathe. We're ready here. Wow. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> that's a tire I caught. Whoa. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Whoa. Wow. A flounder. I would call it a halibut. And I caught it just for the halibut. We get my ladder. We'll go to the hot springs. You going to buy this? Uh, nah. Let's go to the hot springs. Hold on. How about a uh, gumball machine? Hold on. <laughs> you getting a gumball? There's a gumball machine right there. Oh, wow. Look at that. You upgraded. Yeah, quite a bit. I have a treadmill. My Rams, my favorite team in the world. They play water polo, right, Danny? <laughs> I've been watching this since 1957. <laughs> Wait, who's that one? Gloria, she's new. Hi, Gloria. Is she a duck? Yes. She has very nice eyelashes. You're not wrong. And this is all new right here. <laughs> okay. Wow. Do you want to put that new song in here? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love their voice. Thank you very much. All right, let's go to your hot springs. I like the way I run. <laughs> you have to admit, I am very cute. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's flow. <laughs> Here's the ladder. Okay, here we go. Where did you get this? Uh, hello, I am a builder. <laughs> what is this here? A trash can. <laughs> <laughs> a fossil, a fossil, a fossil. We get a shovel. <laughs> to the museum. Come on, hot dog. Wait to see it. They know me by first name. <laughs> This is one of my favorite spots. Butterflies. It, as you can see, we love butterflies. But don't don't tell anybody. Definitely ruins the image. A piranha? Yeah, I've caught one of those too. And the koi. Koi, yeah. Koi on good to eat though. Yeah, too many bones. They're like a giant goldfish, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, my cousin moved into a house and it had this old dirty pond out in the back. When he cleaned it out and everything, it had like some really rare, expensive koi fish. And it was like, whoa, now he's got this beautiful koi pond in back. Yeah, well, it's really funny because every time he goes, yeah, well, I raised koi and they were all there when he got there. You got any favorites down here? Just like looking around. I'm very proud of the fossil collection. 
That and butterflies. I look really cute when I'm catching them, but I think I'm going to make a big drawing of my character. Yeah, put it on That's Facebook. A, what is that, a skull? Yeah. Australopith. Human, yep. Very interesting. Yeah, spooky. <laughs> Rather be in a hot tub. All right, let's go see if we can catch a shark. All right, shark it is. See ya, wouldn't want to be ya. Hey, where'd you get the Danny Trail mustache? Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. He's nibbling, he's nibbling. Ah, you know, some guys can fish. Hmm. I just can't get over how cute I look running. <laughs> so do you enjoy going fishing in real life? Yeah, whenever I can, you know, when I got time. My favorite place is Cabo San Lucas. Check out the telescope. Yep, I can see it. Uranus. <laughs> oh, yeah. There it is. <laughs> watch out, watch out. Whoa, a flounder. That's it. I got him. Oh. Ah, it's okay. We can talk about how big he was, the one that got away. That was the shark. Oh. That's it. I got him. I got him. Yep. Another flounder. <laughs> Where are all the fish? Did you fish out your entire island? I've been fishing quite a bit, so <laughs> my pockets stink. Are you sure you saw sharks? Ooh, 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 ooh. Yes, a uh, sea bass. Nobody casts as good as me. Ah! What is that? Sucker fish. What fish have you caught in real life? Uh, I caught a 220 pound bluefin tuna and uh, I caught a uh, huge sailfish and swordfish. I let them go though. The yeah. tuna I kept, but I, I the other ones, the trophy fish I let go because I, I don't stick them on a wall. We went to a restaurant in Cabo and told them to make us a meal and we'll give them the fish. There were six of us, so they made us a, a meal fit for a king. I imagine. Oh, cool. Another, a turkey fish. They, they, Gobble Only of the fish up. Gobble, gobble. Oh, my God. Only at Thanksgiving. <laughs> hey, we're, we're a pretty good team. I'll be a straight <laughs> man. I can do the... Brum, boom. <laughs> ah, again. Told you, killer. Ah, sea bass. Let it go. I'm going to go try to catch a shark. I don't know more of the fish. You have to admit, I do look cute running. <laughs> Oh, great. <laughs> okay, we got a practical joker. Well, come on over here and knock the oranges off this tree and see what happens. Mm -hmm. I don't miss, buddy. He bass for days. Yes. Wharf roach. Gross. Well, we're definitely getting enough um, cardio. There's snake. Take this hat. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> Way to go, Snake. Do you have a dog, Danny? In real life, I got seven. Yeah, I do. I love them. I got I got from a pit bull to a chihuahua, and the chihuahua makes the pit bull cry. <laughs> That's probably who's crying right now because the chihuahua won't let him out of his doghouse. And her name's Dixie. Yeah, she's a, she's a rock wawa. I know people like that, too. Yeah. I'm going to catch it. Oh, perfect. Perfect trail. Whoa, 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 whoa. Ah, got a ribbon eel. Very rare. Very rare. Very good. I think it's time uh, I headed on my merry way. Okay. It's been great. Hey, we got to do this again, but really got to go shark fishing. All right, Danny. Well, thank you very much for having me. Hey, thank you, man. We'll be cool. Be careful. Have a nice flight. Make um, sure you sanitize everything. <laughs> Twenty twenty is weird, man. <laughs> but like in the best way. You know what I mean? Like, how is this content that we're actually making? Playing playing <laughs> Animal Crossing with Danny Trejo. Like, it's the be it's the best thing. I just love it. To it's bits. so much fun. It's really really cool. Um, and what's what? And here's here's the thing. I would you and I were talking about like how are we going to continue to come up with new things to do with Danny? But Nintendo has stepped oh, into yeah. the breach with this summer update that's dropping in a couple of days. You're going to be able to swim in the ocean and and go scuba diving. I feel like given that Danny loves to fish and he loves to yeah. kind of be by the sea, I feel like I feel like this is the the obvious the obvious next frontier. Right? You guys have got to scuba up and go swimming in the summer update. I don't know. I guess we'll have to wait and see, won't we? I mean, it feels like a no-brainer to me. Well, we'll have to wait and see, won't we? Okay, all right. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm excited. I'm excited. Let me be excited. Now, we did... I don't want to guarantee anything. It's very hard to <laughs> wrangle sometimes. Um, we did, I think, if everything went well, we pulled off a little bit of behind-the-scenes magic there while... Um, 
uh, Danny's Diary video was playing. We got we transitioned to Jimmy off the island. We got uh, Leah off because Lemmy Leah, of course, was playing the part of Shaggy tonight in Avatar form. Um, and we got them off the island, and we got our next guest on. And I'm I am very very excited about our uh, next guest. I can't wait to have him on. In fact, he's going to come and join us uh, in just a moment. Um, very very talented uh, filmmaker director. You probably know him best as the director of the mega blockbuster Kong Skull Island, but he has done and is doing many many other things. Really really cool stuff that he's going to talk talk to us about tonight. Please welcome to Animal Talking, Jordan Vote Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> Get him on here. Get down the stairs. I'm, 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 I'm coming. Uh, wait, I went into the kitchen. Oh my god. Oh, did he go in the kitchen? <laughs> I'm no lo- I'm no longer clapping. Which which <laughs> someone needs to direct me. Which stairs do I go oh to? Oh my god. Adam, go get him, please. <laughs> <laughs> please, just, please escort Mr. Vote Roberts to the set. Right to, the, to the set. Oh my god! Uh, oh my god! <laughs> well, your kitchen was beautiful, and you needed a snack. <laughs> do you want to? Like, do you want to? Do you want to go again? Here, I'll do, I'll do it for you again. John Vote Roberts, everybody. Uh, I uh, I really walked into the kitchen and like I thought I was gonna get murdered in there. <laughs> it looked like a Resident Evil room. Uh, and like a tyrant was going to come in and kill me. It you seemed made like a it. setup. You know what? I'm happy to be here. You know Sorry what? You, about you, that. You, you, you event, no, seriously though, you, you, you are now joined like a great pantheon of guests who have totally blown their, their cues and either <laughs> walk, or either walk down the stairs too early or walk down the wrong stairs or what the hell ever. You trust me, you're not the first and you won't be the last. Thank you. Well, I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad I'm in a group of, uh, of people who equally fuck up. That's that's what I aim to be. That's, what, that's where I aim to be. <laughs> Let's get your Chiron up on the screen here. Here we go. Jordan Vote Roberts. Vote Roberts on Twitter. Jordan, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, man. I, I really, you know, I've told you this before, but, you know, I... I was such a Nintendo nerd that, you know, I was playing at GameCube, like the GameCube Animal Crossing at my friend's house, like back in the day. And people were just looking at it like, what is this game? What do you do here? What is the point of it? And the fact that you like, I really feel like sometimes when you look at like art installations or like, uh, like just really, it's like people being really clever to get to an idea first. We're like, wow, that's just like someone really getting there. And you, you somehow like saw through the matrix and took what was this niche game that I was playing on the GameCube even more than a decade ago, and now you have this incredible talk show that's come from it. I mean, and I wouldn't exactly it. call it a niche game at this point. It was a pop culture no, not, phenomenon yeah, before I got point. involved. It's, it's, well, it's a phenomenon, but you still had the the foresight to like then make it become this. And I'm in your waiting room talking to Kiki, who's one of my favorite people, watching your chat as you're talking about anime, being jealous that I can't be in here talking about Attack on Titan and shit. So, we're, well, like, we're here you know, now, and if you want to, I'll talk to you about Attack on Titan all day long. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> but, let, but, but, uh, but, but, but but first of all let me let me uh dispose of, of any uh preconceptions you may have there was no foresight there's no vision i was just bored like goofing around on this you know like all the best viral all the stuff that blows up like it just this happened we fell ass backwards into this this happened completely by yeah accident. but you, you still saw through the code in the matrix in a weird way i guess it wasn't you it wasn't you trying to be like oh how do i make this thing happen i mean you know it create like creatively even when you're working on movies or scripts or whatever it's those things that you kind of just fall ass backwards into that like are the best things you know when you're when you're trying when you're thinking about it you're trying too hard and you're losing like the core and the truth speaking speaking of animal crossing tell me about this avatar of yours the interesting look you've got going (laughs) well it's very difficult to represent my giant two foot long beard um so i just (laughs) got this mustache uh or this beard thing but before that i had to like paint on like a pattern onto my face which just like gave me these spikes on the side where i look right. like shitty wolverine <laughs> um <laughs> and uh yeah i just kind of created ash's outfit from yeah pokemon. i was gonna say you've got kind of like an ash from pokemon thing going on here right oh yeah 100 percent. i are really you, are, you a, are you a pokemon I, I i'm not but like i have an eight-year-old daughter so i am whether i want to be or not are you big time into pokemon <laughs> Oh, yeah, huge. I mean, I, I remember you tweeted a little bit ago about how you didn't understand how Pokemon isn't like um, uh, sort of like uh, 
cockfighting and and like to animals fighting and like when you really understand pokemon and like the way that these things like aren't exactly animals as we see them and like what pokemon represent in the world pokemon was a huge influence to me like blue and red you know came out around the same time as like metal gear and uh and ocarina of time you know like 96 97 like those years had such influential things and um I just love the the energy and the vibe of Pokemon so much. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a big dork about it. Were you what, blue what? or red? Blue all day, Squirtle. Oh 100%. yeah, blue right. represent. So when well, I ask what my favorite Pokemon is, I mean Gengar is pretty high up there. Um, <laughs> I still like Squirtle is like one of my favorite things ever. Yeah. Um, I also this is a really weird one, but um, Zatu is one of my favorite characters who people wow. really dislike, but his his lore of how he can like simultaneously like see into the future and the past and is sort of like um paralyzed by it and doesn't move i think is like one of the strangest most interesting like there's so many pokemon that have these really interesting pieces of backstory even like cubone who like wears you know hypothetically it's mother's skull which is such a sad interesting like story to for like and 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 evolution and growth and i love those elements of the pokemon world what i what i love about you what i love about you jordan and it's and it's obvious just hearing you talk right now is that like your nerddom is a hundred percent authentic like you're a big time hollywood guy you directed these big hollywood movies but like you're not one of these like hollywood guys that's like oh yeah like the young people are into video games look at this spreadsheet like i should get into this shit like you are a hundred percent like dyed in the wall authentic gamer so so tell me about your tell me about your gaming roots well i mean Honestly, if I was smarter back in the day, like if I was good at math, I probably would have went into video games. Like I like film and video games were my like two loves. And I really like I love film. I was obsessed with it. I, you know, I I devoured it. I, I, you know, I, I, I'm a slave to it in so many ways. But like, you know, um, Journey for, you know, the, the, the PS3, when I played that, that was something where I was like, I, this is one of my favorite experiences in oh, any me medium, it, like medium. It's it, it, like, and, and there's just things happening in video games that I find to be so disruptive. <clears throat> and I, um, I was just, you know, I was part of the first generation of, of gamers who didn't have purchasing power. So when I, when I was growing up, you know, I wasn't old enough to choose like what console I have. And that's why I'm involved in console wars with Seth Rogen, because they're literally like, <clears throat> um, the Sega Nintendo rivalry is so interesting to me because <clears throat> that was the start of like, um, arbitrary division, you know, like Gamergate and like, um, <clears throat> and uh you know like like people didn't lose friends over coke versus pepsi right right like that was that was a giant thing of oh is it coke versus pepsi whatever but you don't you didn't lose friends because somebody liked pepsi over coke but back in that day the way they weaponized technology like if you had a, a genesis or a nintendo that said something about you and you judged the other person and that um I'm the one coughing, by the way, for the person asking. I, I always have like a throat cough. Sorry. Um, but um, uh, I think it weaponized like the way we look at technology now. Like, oh, you've got an Apple or you've got a Samsung, you know, like the the arbitrary things that somehow like uh, these the, these say something about you and you then you you judge people based on it. And I think that like, you know, Internet trolls and and the way that like people like find these arbitrary things to to stick to really stems from like that those console wars in the 90s and and the way that that stuff was weaponized and just at an early age you know like just Zelda and Metroid and you know all of these things they they just rewired my brain you know Tim Schafer's stuff the Lucas Arts games the adventures get the games like they just were different experiences that I I was just obsessed with and I love I love the language of video games I love watching it evolve I love watching like what they've become um and for me um so a it's like in my DNA you know that's why I want to be involved in so many video game movies but um it's it's incredible watching something like this where you have a tv show in animal crossing and and frankly the other part is like i really genuinely like hanging out with people like kiki or amy hennig or uh, like vince from respawn like or you know there's a lot of like i like hanging out with game people way more than i do half the time with film people i find them more interesting to talk to i find them like nicer i think that they're like they're like there's there's just more like creativity bouncing back and forth between mediums um you know i'm i'm very fortunate and lucky to be able to like have those relationships but 
but I find them more inspiring than like a lot of film stuff. You know, film can become very stagnant. I, you know, I, I mean, you're very much my kind of people because I, I did it kind of more in a, in a linear way. You know, I had a whole career in video games and then I got into film and had a career in film. But like, there's still, I still love both things equally. I still play video games and watch movies. And to me, it's all part of the same, you know, kind of magic that, that we weave. It's just, you know, the medium's different, but like, it's all the same stuff, like transporting people to other other places. And, and, I, and, I, and I love that you kind of have, you know, again, you've got kind of one foot in both worlds. You touched on earlier about like people in, in games that are your friends and you like to hang out with. And I, as you know, I'm fascinated by people who have super famous friends. Uh, so I got to ask you about your friendship <laughs> with, I, <laughs> I'm just such a star fucker sometimes. Um, but I, I, Jordan, I got to ask you, because here's the thing, I'm, I'm going to go over to the monitor right now. R just recently, you were quite famously uh, in Death Stranding. And here you are right here in holographic form with uh, Norman Reedus. And this, and this came about uh, because you are... BFFs with Hideo, Hideo, Hideo Kojima. Tell me how that friendship started and what is it like being buddies with Hideo Kojima? Well, that photo that you just showed, by the way, is the actual photo of Kojima-san holding his iPad, showing me oh, for the I've, first time. Oh, don't worry. I got that too. Here we go. Here we go. I got it for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so that's him like showing me myself in his game. And that's one of the most surreal things on the planet to me. Metal Gear is one of the most important. Um, pro you know, I've been on that movie for six years and I've been fighting every single day to make sure that we translate that movie properly because I, I am so fortunate that I was able to take this path into film and then through a lot of like launch campaigns uh, for, for video game commercials and in general, like sort of interweave myself in the game world, I feel very fortunate to be able to have a foot in both, in both realms. But with Kojima-san... <laughs> You know, Metal Gear was one of those games that shaped, you know, that was like a Star Wars-esque experience for me. And, um, you know, so we initially went like, well, when I, I was at a meeting at Sony and there was a Metal Gear book on the desk and they were trying to pitch me a bunch of other movies. And I was like, do you have Metal Gear Solid? And they literally were like, yeah, 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 yeah but that's not for you. And I was like, <laughs> I, I, am going I, I disagree. I am going to prove to you that there's not a single person in Hollywood who understands this property the like military surrealism the japanese goofiness the like walking talking ideologies and like you know philosophies that the characters represent the like the uh the almost survival horror element the like the Tark tarkovsky influence <clears throat> and so i put together this massive book breaking down like what metal gear is how you translate it into a movie and it took a year <clears throat> and they hired me on it and it was six years ago <clears throat> And I met Kojima-san like a while ago, and he was obviously kind of like, who is this kid who had, you know, who's only done this like small indie Kings of Summer, which is a movie that I'm very proud of. But like, um, you know, this was before Kong. This was before I made it. And so we met and we sort of had um, like a very from afar relationship. We would go back and forth. We'd see each other at Comic-Con here and there. And then when Kong came out, he he really loved it. And um, he actually... Um, when Kings of Summer was then released in Japan, he wrote line. I didn't know he did this. He wrote liner notes for the, the DVD release. And in it, he was like, you know, because then we had gotten to know each other so well. We, we, we had so many talks and so many dinners and so many back and forths about film. And he really is like, he he's a bigger cinephile than um, most people in Hollywood. And so uh, it's it's surreal for me because he's a legend to me, right? He He's a legitimate icon. And so I have these conversations with him where I'm talking to someone who's now my friend, but at the same time, I'm like, you influenced my entire life. You shape huge parts of my my creative process. And, you know, when you, when you talk about his work in video games, like now we're at the point where he'll like open up and like, you know, tell stories about how things happened or whatever. But at first, like, you know, he, he didn't really like to talk about game stuff. We would just talk about films. And then we just started having these, these dinners and these long, long conversations about art and about life. And um, we got to know each other really well. And that's super surreal that then I'm scanned and I'm in a Kojima-san game and I, I'm still beating Breath of the Wild, and so I like I haven't played through Death Stranding, but I'm I'm sort of afraid that like when I encounter my virtual self, that like I'm gonna create some rift in the space time continuum, or <laughs> or like the the simulation is gonna crash. Um, but it's I mean I feel so fortunate 
to be able to be around uh, Kojima-san and Shinkawa-san and everyone at, at Kojima Productions. And like, I was able to see the whole making of Death Stranding and, and play early builds and understand what it was. And um, yeah, I just, it's, it's one of the more surreal things um in my life uh where that person is like a legend and a hero to me and an icon and then also someone that i consider like a dear friend and a uh and like a collaborator it's um, it's it's a dream i'm gonna put some of this amazing concept art that you sent me that you've commissioned um as part of the process of of developing and making this movie some of it's been done with uh industrial light and magic let's go over here i mean some of this art is just incredible as as i paid through this art here talk to me a little bit because you know i work in hollywood so <coughs> as, as well so i i understand what the challenges are here you know part of the appeal of metal gear solid is that you know it's it's cool it's action but it's also it's political it's it's sometimes it's just batshit crazy it's like how, how do you take something that is so <coughs> idiosyncratic and so kojima and somehow find a way to, to convince a Hollywood studio to spend a, what's going to obviously be a huge amount of money to make something that is palatable to like, you know, the kind of the mainstream, you know, global audience that they that they want to they want to get to. Like, it's, it, it, is it how, how, how do you how do you bring those two worlds together? Well, I mean, first, this art that you're going through, this is all stuff that I commissioned myself and, and, and you know, Industrial Light and Magic, ILM, they stepped in to do this. But this is a lot of artists that I worked with on Kong because when I worked on Kong, I specifically hired a lot of video game artists who had never worked in film before because I felt like a lot of film concept artists were uh, very, you know, it's the same shit. And, the, and, and I wanted people who had, like, that spark and that young creativity the way, and the way that, like, video game designers work and the fact that ILM, then put their hand in and said we want to do some stuff like you're talking about in like ilm doing metal gear art <clears throat> and this was stuff that was like we were writing the script and i just had to get these images out you know i was so inspired that like as Derek Connolly is a great writer <clears throat> um I just, I needed to be making this. I needed to get this imagery out to sort of express, because it's interesting, Metal Gear is one of the most popular games on the planet, but when you Google like art for it, it's a lot of like screenshots from the game. It's a lot of just character art, and there's not a lot of like concept art that's like just move. So I commissioned all that stuff myself, and I paid for it all myself, <clears throat> um, just because I had to sort of like get that creativity out of me. And a big part of it, you know, you ask about like translating um, Metal Gear. <clears throat> It is tricky because it's sprawling and it's huge and it's complicated. And, you know, like, honestly, you look at sort of how genre movies work now. And a big part of it is trying to convince the studio to say, don't be afraid of the, the weird things of this. C commit and double down to the things that are like Kojima-san and make Metal Gear what it is. And like, I'm really, really proud of the script that we have because we're doing, I mean, first of all, <laughs> Kojima-san said to me, um... When I asked him, do you have any advice for me? He said, this, and this is such a Kojima-san thing. He said, betray your audience. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> okay, well, I'm not exactly going to do that. I, uh, you know, but I really do, like, I have a plan of how you get across all of the idiosyncratic things that are Metal Gear, but, and, and, and like, not just fan service, but you double down on that stuff enough. In the same way, no one knew who Rocket Raccoon or Groot or Star Lord and those people were four years ago. Now you get in an Uber or something and they've got a little like Funko Pop or a little thing on their dashboard. To me, the same is true with Sniper Wolf and Revolver Ocelot and Snake and, you know, Cyborg Ninja. And all, all of those characters are as iconic as all of the Marvel characters. And so to me, it's about doubling down on the things that make Metal Gear what it is so that it then expresses to a wider audience why there's such a group of people that are in love with, it, you know, and not being afraid of it. And granted, you have to like focus it. You know how difficult it is to, to translate properties like that. But we're doing we're doing something very um, <clears throat> cool and unexpected with the script that I think is like very in line with like the way that Metal Gear itself fucks with the format of video games. We're doing something that like fucks with the format of what you would expect from a film. And I'm just, you know, like I grew up in a time watching movies, like uh, video game movies based on things I love be bastardized. And that's why I'm so interested in making video game movies because I think that like it took people like Sam Raimi and people who grew up loving Spider-Man and had their like their brains rewired by comics to make great comic book movies. And now we're reaching a point, you know, with you and, and me and Dan Trachtenberg and a lot of people who equally we're sort of like rewired by games and to me there's just this fundamental element of um translating the feeling 
that a game elicits from you in an active experience to how you put that on screen, how you translate that feeling that's elicited into the passive experience of watching a movie. You know, it's so easy for companies to look at something like Metal Gear and just say, this is a futuristic sci-fi thing. Or, you know, it like Kiki's doing amazing stuff with Halo, but it would be so easy for them to just be like, look at this armor, look at these guns, whatever. You know, that's how old video game adaptations were, where they just looked at like the little pieces of the IP, you know, instead of like really fundamentally understanding what makes these things tick what 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 these games made people feel and and that's what i'm trying to do with metal i mean i could talk about that forever and but i (laughs) i really i wish i could say more in every single comment when i post anything on on uh instagram is tell me about metal gear tell me about metal gear you know And (laughs) and i and i release art like every here and there like online like you know to sort of keep the community alive and i was doing stuff during the quarantine just to sort of cheer people up um because i i you know normally i would never be able to release that art it'd be studio art but i paid for it all myself so um i can release it and let it out to the world and and it's such a cat it's an avengers cavalcade of of, of like incredible artists who all contributed to it it's funny you and i are kind of on these similar journeys like you this this is your great white whale mine is the last starfighter and we kind of did, did similar approaches where we commissioned concept art dropped it on the internet you know getting people excited trying to kind of whip up the enthusiasm for it while you know be behind the scenes actually kind of doing the work you know with the studios to try and get the thing made as i go back to monitor 2 here and show some more of this amazing art that you've commissioned to make them help make the movie and um we're, we're showing it right now just okay so we understand the enthusiasm the dream the drive to make it but it's a miracle to get anything made in hollywood hollywood especially yeah. something as big and expensive as this where are you with it right now you you're obviously been working on it for a long time you say you have a script you have this amazing concept art what at this point what what chance do you give yourself that you're actually going to be one day standing on a set shooting this movie oh god i hate this question (laughs) (laughs) um look this is my baby i've been working on this thing for six years trying to make it so it is the like disruptive punk rock like like true to metal gear true to kojima san spirit version of what this is and I will continue to fight for it every day. I'm trying to also get like an animated um, series going that brings back David Hayter and like the original voice cast, you know, and doing that in tandem. But yeah, it's a difficult thing. Getting any movie made in Hollywood is hard, you know, and getting something like Metal Gear made where um, uh, it is so complex is even harder. And that's why I'm trying to make it for a budget where you can do the crazy shit, you know, where you can do the um, the the Metal Gear version of it, you know, where it, is, it isn't neutered. And I would love nothing more than to... Uh, I thought I was going to be on set in this movie like a year ago. Um, Right now, there's a bunch of, you know, COVID has sort of changed everything and we're figuring out a bunch of stuff. I have no idea when it's going to go. I will I will fight for it every single day. I, I will fight to try and get this animated series going in conjunction with it. You know, there's there's actors that that I love that I would love to uh, like cast as Snake that I won't answer any questions about who those are. Um, <laughs> but um you know i really it it's tough man it's tough getting movies made especially something where you're trying to be bold like this and um so i will fight every single day until um until i can't <laughs> you I know doubt, I, like, I, I i doubt there's anyone left at this point who's going i don't know about this guy if he's really legit or not like having heard you talk but let's <laughs> let's let's there be for that one person still in the back going i'm not sure uh if jordan is 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 legit when it comes to his love for metal gear solid tell me about this tattoo <laughs> um so this is, this is recent right yeah this is recent so that's upside down but ultimately look you know getting a tattoo of like a movie uh that i haven't even done in theory would seem like a horrible idea but it's actually not about that it's about the not only the time that i've spent on this project um <clears throat> But just my love of the project in general and Kojima-san. So it's upside down, but it's it's an exclamation point. And the exclamation point is made, if you put that back on screen, it's made out of the the, the gray stripes with the start select um, uh, elements that were that were on the NES controller. Oh, my God. Like, you know, it's, it's so like it's it's made. It's like if you look at it upside down, it's it's the Metal Gear exclamation point made out of the the stripes from the uh, the middle of the NES controller. You can see the see the start and select. There's a way for me to flip this. Hold on, let me see if I can flip <laughs> and then, the image. And then in the middle, because um, 
Uh, oop, everything went just hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a little flippy flippy. Give me a oh, second a here. Flippy. There we go. I flipped it. I flipped it for you. Now you can see the exclamation. Oh, there we go. Uh, I don't see it yet. Oh, there you go. There you go. You're a few so, seconds behind me. There yeah, you go. So it's an exclamation point, and and then the middle of it is like a very graphic representation because my my le uh, left hand got like really horribly burned. I was involved in like an accident a couple of years ago, uh, and like I had crazy skin grafts on it, and so, um. The middle of it is like a graphic representation of the tools inside of Luke's arm in Star Wars. So it's, it's like, oh wow, it's, it's like, like triple no, Easter tattoo. eggs, Easter eggs inside Easter eggs. Yeah, in this it's, tattoo, it's very layered, but but it's less about like, oh, Metal Gear, I'm making this movie. Here's this tattoo, and instead, it's like. <clears throat> I've spent so much time on this, regardless of what happens with the movie, regardless of where it goes. This is like this is how important it is to me. This is how important like uh, the 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 time, the conversations, like the the real like once once I was able to like really get the honest, real Kojima san and like, you know, get behind the curtain and like start to understand sort of who he is and makes him tick there. It's all just stuff that's affected me in my life, you know? And, um, and so it just felt right to, you know, regardless of like when the, it's not even about like me being attached to the movie. It's about my love of like what the game is and what it represents. I want to show a little clip of something here that you directed quite recently. Um, I know that you're obviously you're a big video game nerd. That, that much is clear. You, uh, desperately want to make this Metal Gear solid movie. I really, really hope you, you get to do that. But you know, one, one way that you get to scratch this itch in the meantime is you do a lot of commercials work. I know that you shot like a big, very splashy, expensive live action commercial for destiny Two when that game launched and you realize this is the clip I'm going to show. I'm going to show this whole thing. It's basically the length of a movie trailer, but it's really, really cool. You show a whole live action cinematic trailer um, as part of the PlayStation 4 launch for Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. I'm going to go over to monitors, yeah. so I'm going to show the clip and we'll talk about it on the other side. Here we go. Oh my god so much fun so much fun <laughs> that, that i mean good. so that looked like it was a lot of fun and by, and by the way it, that's beautifully shot who was your dp on that uh chung hoon chung shot that who is the dp of old boy and uh a lot of park chan wook's work um he's amazing <clears throat> um he shot the first it um he's someone i've collaborated with a bunch and want to continue working with in the future but he i mean he shot old boy dude like well is. and i was gonna say even before you <clears throat> mentioned that i noticed there's one particular side on shot yeah. there that looked like a little bit of a nod there's, to old boy there's, there's, uh, yeah it was a very surreal moment shooting a 
homage to the old boy fight sequence, <laughs> the hallway sequence with <clears throat> with the the P of it. And it's funny, he told me that that sequence was originally storyboarded. There was like a huge fight, and like they basically ran out of time. And so like the reason that the hallway fight exists that way is because they ran out of time, and they they were like, well, we have to shoot it this way. And like, and I think that that's how like the most like brilliant things happen. I think what separates like good filmmakers from great filmmakers is sort of the the moment <clears throat> when things go wrong or you're losing light or a prop breaks or or an actor's late or whatever like can you turn that into um uh something better can you find the greater truth of that moment can you like can you make something better of it can you capture magic in that moment <clears throat> and that PUBG thing we shot in two days it's crazy it's got nick robinson from my first movie you know uh kings of summer and he's in jurassic world and you know love simon and then jason mitchell who was in kong <clears throat> and we shot that in two days that's a lot oh of shit two days shoot. oh my god yeah <clears throat> and that was a great thing where that script came to me and <clears throat> You know, it was with this agency, Battery, who I've done a lot of work with. And, you know, the script itself was just sort of like guy lands in a room, beats the shit out of like a bunch of people with a pan. And so, you know, they, we have a great relationship where then all of that stuff, the setting in the field, the way all of the action works, they sort of let me design all of that stuff. And, and, and for me, you know, that's another thing where it's like... I'm really proud of the fact that like on commercials like that or the Destiny one, when you look at the comments, it's a lot of people being like, that's how I feel when I play this game. Even though it's like not a direct translation, because there actually are PUBG commercials out there that are like are almost to a T what the game is. But I'm more interested in translating the feeling. Right. You know, I'm more interested in like <clears throat> capturing like the the like what it elicits from you as you like and even in metal gear when you think about like the, the terror of like you know of, of uh, uh being caught you know like the panic of invasion the 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 uh, like edge of your seat like tenseness of like sneaking around <clears throat> there's so many like feelings that you have to translate and that PUBG one was just like me literally going nuts and having a ton of fun and uh you know it was um i'm really proud of that one um they really let like that's a huge nod to battery the agency and the PUBG people for letting me just kind of like they had this script that basically was like guy lands beats the fuck out of a bunch of people with a pan and then at the end like meets up with teammates and so you know i was able to fill in all the gaps in between with them and um uh it's rare that you get to do that in commercials because normally in commercials, it's like this happens and this happens and this is exactly what happens. And um, uh, they gave me a lot of freedom. And so with that freedom, I can sort of try my best to translate the feeling. And, you know, it's interesting because there's a lot of stuff where it's like you can't have two pans in the game. You can't do this. And when you when you make video game commercials like on Destiny, <clears throat> there's a lot of things where it's like, oh, well, you can't really do that in the game. And it's like, right. But if that doesn't really matter. Like we're, we're selling like an emotion we're selling like a feeling of something and um and and so it's a, it's always an interesting back and forth and i actually really like dealing with like the game developers and that's why like the the destiny commercial was great because i got to go and hang out with the bungee guys who are legends you know who who worked on shit that also changed my life and and it's important for me to like talk to them about the ethos of what they're doing so that i can try and translate that into a spot we're running a little bit long, and that's a, a tribute yeah, talk, to, to how forever. great our guests are. Uh, Shag, Shaggy obviously was a delight. Jimmy was fantastic. Uh, Shag, Shaggy with that clutch comedy save of the night. I'm still thinking about that one. And you, Jordan, always be great. And stick around, because here's what I want to do. I know that you, you and my next guest are pals, so let's get you on the couch together let's let's do this um my okay so jordan's already repositioning himself on the couch very politely i love that thank you so much <laughs> my next guest has been a f I, i've been friends with her forever and i'm so glad to finally get her on the show kiki wolfkill is the head of transmedia at 343 which basically means if there's a halo tv show or a movie or anything that kind of expands the universe uh, the storytelling beyond just the games that's what she's in charge of and there's a big big halo tv show live action tv show coming down the pike that uh, wait, wait wait get 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 kiki back up the stairs yeah, please you can go back to the kitchen <laughs> <laughs> oh jordan so we've, had, so, so we've had Jimmy drop his connection. We've had Jordan <laughs> Jordan wandering into the kitchen. And now we've got Kiki coming down the stairs too early. Oh, my God. Poor Kate. Poor, poor stage manager, I'm Kate. Sorry. I'm sorry. We're good. We're good. We're good. Let me let, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, you know, big you up first before you come down the stairs. 
Yeah, she's Kiki, one of the best. Big her up big. Kiki Wolfkill, <laughs> one of the architects of the of the Halo universe. My goodness. Uh, she's been named one of the 10 most powerful women in gaming by Fortune magazine, one of Fast Company's 100 most creative people in business, and recently was named one of the top 10 worst people at walking downstairs at the correct time. Please <laughs> welcome to Animal Talking, my good friend, Kiki Wolfkill. <laughs> Oh, I made it on the couch. You made it. You made it. I Kiki. feel very successful. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Oh my gosh, it's um, amazing to be here, and um, you know, I'm kind of bringing up the rear here. It's been an amazing show. So, Top of the um, bill, saving the best for last. <laughs> That's how I'm I like hoping to it's an hoping it's an anchor leg. <laughs> I'm so, I'm sorry for keeping you waiting. The show always runs long, but I know I know that you and Jordan are like BFF, so let's get you on the couch together. How how did you two become pals? How, um oh. we met in a karaoke room <laughs> through um Ken right. who uh was the producer uh for Kojima san on many of the Metal Gear games and is one of the uh, also like one of my greatest friends and best people and one of the best people in gaming and he invited me to a karaoke room in LA just saying hey come out and Kiki was there and uh and then I think we had like cream barbecue afterwards is that right Yeah yeah Anyone who uh, remains friends with me after witnessing me at karaoke, um, it's it runs deep. So, Kiki, what is, what is what is your what is your karaoke go to? Um, so uh, I I I am a I'm a very good performer and a um, not a very good singer. So I rely on the crowd. So living on a prayer is my go to. Oh, I, I love just, it. I just have to get to that chorus, and then the crowd does the rest of the work. Johnny went to work on the dock. I can do it. <laughs> I can do it too. I mean, not as, I mean, not very well apparently, but I, I can. I, I'll, I'll, belt, I'll, belt it, I'll belt it out. Um, Kiki, you I. you are no stranger to talk shows, isn't that right? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yes, I I've been tricked into being on a talk show before. So, so this is this is, this is not your first radio. You have been interviewed by Conan O'Brien on the Conan Show. I am going to zap over to Monitor Two right now and show a little clip of this oh from I believe this is when uh, Halo Four came out. Yes. All right, let's let's go to it and we'll talk about. I'm going to show like just a, just a quick clip of this and we'll we'll talk about it uh, on the other side. Hey, this is pretty exciting. I am sitting here with uh, two of the brainchilds behind Halo Four, uh, Frank O'Connor. Uh, who is the franchise director? Yes. Is that correct? Yep. And uh, Kiki Wolfkill. Found name. That is an insane name. That is fantastic. Yeah. So Frank O'Connor and Kiki Wolfkill. Yeah. So you're like a Nordic dragon slayer and you're her bartender. Yeah. <laughs> I never get tired of that clip. I'm sure, I'm, Kiki, I'm, I, I'm sure you do get tired, though, of people commenting on the awesomeness of your name. Well, um, yeah, I don't ridiculous. get, you know, I wish I had something I had earned, right? Like if it was a skill based thing, I would feel um, a little more reward from it. But I, I literally just sort of showed up on the earth and was given that name. But I do, I do appreciate it. I will say that, um, uh, you know, I was not expecting to be, I, I was there to help support, you know, to show them what part of the games they could show, what they couldn't show. I had, I had no intention of being on camera, hence the deer in the headlights. I have no idea what the hell is going on. Looking <laughs> I'm gonna I'm um, gonna take a very brief de I'm, I'm gonna take a very brief detour here because you can't see this because I'm not on camera. But my seven year old daughter just wandered into the into the animal talking studio over here. <laughs> she's gonna she's she's turning eight tomorrow. She's gonna be eight. Can you step over here. Say say hello to everyone. There she is. That's my that's my daughter. She it's her eighth birthday tomorrow. So please, everyone in the chat, wish her a happy eighth birthday. Now, Aww, go happy back birthday. to bed. Get out of here, you little monkey. Good night. <laughs> She lit, she crept up because I've got my headphones on. I can't hear a thing. She crept up on me. That and that, by the way, is also DJ Cupcakes, our resident house DJ here on Animal Talking. We got to get we got to get her back on the show next week uh, to to spin some platters that matter. Um, okay, back to you, Kiki. Tell me. Uh, so you've had this incredible career in games. How did you get started? Were you were you a gamer as a young girl? And if so, how did that lead into your first job in video games? Yeah, um, I was always a gamer. Um, I mean, 
uh, I don't think that, well, I know it wasn't really my intention to go into making games, mostly because I just didn't really get that people made games. Like, I, I, I don't know where I thought they came from. No one had to talk with me about where games <laughs> Do you think like the, the, like the stores just <laughs> dropped them on your doorstep or something yeah. in a nice little basket? <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, so I played games. You know, I played old school arcade games. Um, I had a 2600. Um, not unlike Jordan, I did not have disposable income. So I, I felt like whatever games uh, I had to play were whatever my parents bought at a garage sale for us. So I did own ET. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I love playing games because I, uh, I was sort of an avid reader, um, a huge consumer of, of games and books and movies, um, really, really into the experience of escaping into another world. Um, and so I definitely gravitated towards, towards storytelling and visual storytelling in particular. Um, I was an art minor. Um, strangely, I was a Chinese history major. Um, but I left college wanting to make documentary films. Like for me, expressing culture and history and a historical perspective through visuals was something I was really intrigued by. Um, and I got into digital editing and because I needed money, I took an internship digitizing video and honestly really fell into games uh, and started working on cinematics uh, and doing compositing work for, for game cinematics, which is how I fell into it. Um, and once I did, I just, I was captivated. I loved the creative challenge of trying to tell a story with so, at the time, very few pixels on screen. Um, I loved the challenge of how competitive an industry it was, meaning you could never just sort of sit back. Um, and because I, I was on the art side, it, it really, you know, through the, the graphic card and console wars was so much about how much you can express uh, through the visuals and visual fidelity. And, and then we sort of plateaued, right? Then we plateaued on, on really the graphic capabilities and it became less about how do you make everything look as realistic as possible and more about how do you really express yourself artistically in a different way. And I think at the same time as that was happening visually, it was also happening with storytelling and narrative. Um, how, and how does so, it, how, sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. No, I was just going to say for me, you know, the, 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 the possibilities around narrative and storytelling with games when you're really invested um, and have a, a, a sense of agency um, uh, really is what captivated me about, about games. How does this all um, wind up with you working quick, at Microsoft and then 343 and the Halo frame? Real quick, just also just oh. to reiterate, Kiki truly is such a badass. Like <laughs> one of the people who like, every time I talk to her, every time I interact with her, you know, you, like I come away inspired in some other way, the way that she thinks and, and the way that she just described her path through all of this. She's one of the most unique minds in the industry and i mean the fact that she's willing to like accept my weirdo ass is like is, is <laughs> testament in itself but she is um just one of the biggest badasses in the entire industry that oh is we're, we're, we're gonna get into it we haven't even scratched the surface of what a badass geeky is the rest of this show is basically just gonna be oh like geeky fan club we're gonna <laughs> we're, don't worry we're getting into it so geeky t tell me about microsoft 343 and halo like because you're 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 a big you're, yeah. you're a big deal in the halo world these days well you know um well I'll, I'll back up i i i started uh so my first uh, real game was a PC game called Kart Precision Racing, um, a racing game uh, where uh, I was a subject matter expert for the racing school and also did all the uh, the training animations. Um, but I, I really started in racing games. And uh, so I was, I was the art director for the racing game studio at Microsoft. Um, so when Xbox launched, uh, I was uh, the art director for Project Gotham Racing working with bizarre creations um, and, and, you know, racing was, was part of my personal life, but um, I, I worked on a lot of racing games and then really started to move into broader genres, um, worked on mass effect on gears, on crackdown, on fable. Um, and, and in 2008, uh, the opportunity as three, four, three was starting up. Uh, Bonnie was starting three, four, three, 
um, I got the opportunity to, to join 343, not as an art director, but as an executive producer. Um, and I'd been having talks with Shane Kim, who at the time had run Xbox, about moving into uh, more of a cross-discipline EP, sort of project leadership role. And and so when the opportunity came up at 343, um, I was super excited. I was a huge Halo fan, like huge, huge Halo fan um, from the beginning. Uh, and so it was kind of a dream come true to have the opportunity. At the time, it wasn't Halo 4. You know, at the time we were uh, we were working on um, uh, something else uh, in the Halo universe, and um, we then decided to build Halo 4 internally. And so uh, I built. Uh, I hired the team to build Halo 4. Um, it was probably the most gratifying professional experience of my life. Um, it was one of those things where. It's like the risk reward was immense. Um, it's like, you know, either this is going to be, um, you know, a really uh, great achievement or, you know, I'll go down in a giant ball of fire and that, you know, that's a great trade off. Right. That's when the best um, shit happens, though. Exactly. Exactly. If you're not a little bit scared all the time and sometimes um, sort of bedwettingly scared, um, you know, you're not you're not being ambitious enough. I'm, I must be, I must be very ambitious then. <laughs> I, I had the moment where I, I really felt like I was fucking up Kong and I've called um, uh, Phil from uh, Lord and Miller and I was like, and I know that Gary, you've had uh, a lot of great interactions. Is, is, is Phil Lord just all of our therapists on the, on the, on the side yeah, or something? So. I think so. And I called him and I literally said, I, I think I'm fucking this up, man. And he said to me, um, if you didn't, if you didn't feel that way, it would be a yeah. problem. The He's fact totally that you right too. Way, the fact that you feel that way means you care. And if you if you didn't feel that way, like sure, maybe you get to a point where you have such like you know it's such a fine line between like Kanye level confidence where you're also executing, but you're out of your mind. But if you, if you're not a little bit scared, then you're not pushing yourself. And it's, it's, you know, it's a horribly perverse backwards thing. But you're absolutely right. I, I I talk I talk about this all the time when I do like screenwriting seminars and conventions and talks and things like that. But yeah, the 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 only way to kind of know that you're on the right track is if you're terrified and convinced that you're screwing up and having imposter syndrome like the more the more you think you're killing it the more you're probably actually in trouble oh yeah anytime someone right. comes back and they shot a movie and i'm like how'd it go and they were like it was awesome it went great i'm like that movie's gonna suck <laughs> <laughs> you know and it's hard because it you know it doesn't mean you're going to be successful with it right but but you know that um you know, you put everything into it and there's a million things that can ultimately affect whether the thing is successful or not. But, you know, you got to you got to swing big um, or you don't even have a chance at it. So, Kiki, you are now you have risen to this role, a really interesting role that you have at Free 343, which is head of transmedia, which means and it's a Halo's very, very story centric or the massive mythology, all this storytelling that goes that take that takes place inside the, the games. But you're now in charge of building that out outside of the games and like the, the big project right now is the big live action TV show that you're developing um, at Showtime. And I know, I know that you're well into production on that. I know there's very little you can tell us, but t tell, tell us what you can about uh, the Halo TV show and the other stuff that you're doing to kind of expand the Halo universe outside of the games themselves. Yeah. Well, I mean, for sure, the biggest thing we're doing right now is Halo Infinite, which um, I wish I could talk more about. But I will say there is an extraordinarily talented team um, who is who is busting ass right now on that and it's it's incredibly exciting um it's funny because you know with that happening at the same time as the tv show um it's just uh it's it's really an extraordinary time uh to be at 343 um but yeah the tv show man you know um it's it's been a long time uh that we've been working on that and you know as jordan says um and i was surprised by all of this um walking into hollywood as a um as as me um you know it's really hard to get things done and we we signed on that's, with Showtime. that's the understatement of the century <laughs> yeah like sometimes i'm amazed that anything gets done honestly um but on the flip side of that is once something is kind of in the shoot you know coronavirus uh delays aside um, it moves at an incredibly fast rate, and it's um, it's really different that way from game development in terms of um, sort of the the linearity of the process. Um, but yeah, we've been with Showtime on this, and and you know we went we went through a, a period of really trying to figure out the right creative combination 
um, and also figuring out what it meant for Showtime and Halo to come together, right? Because they, they um, you know, they're two different entities who both have had success and, um, you know, Showtime has really, really strong expertise in places that we don't. Um, and, uh, and Halo is, um, is a new kind of show for them. Um, so they've been amazing partners in in sort of like acknowledging and understanding and working to really uh, collaborate on understanding those differences and figuring out what is the right adaptation for Halo. And I, I love to hear Jordan talking about the work that he does, because I think, you know, we look at it very much the same way, which is, you know, how do we take something and not try and verbatim translate it to a different medium? But how do we look at what the experience can mean for people? And, you know, for me, I look at it as how do people feel when they come out of uh, playing the game or how do they feel after reading one of the novels uh, or engaging in any of the kind, different kinds of experiences that we have? Um, because that's really sort of the core of what the universe and entering the universe uh, should mean. Um, but then you also want it to be different, right? Because the whole point of going to a different medium is to let yourself and let the IP express itself in a different way. And with television, we get long form storytelling, we get to develop characters, we get to really dig into their backgrounds and their motivations and who they are emotionally, and they can express it as themselves, as opposed to needing to reflect who they are through some of the other characters um, as we do in the game. And so that's an incredibly um, interesting um, and slightly mind-bending uh, challenge. Now, Jordan touched on the the very true uh, fact earlier that you are some kind of ultimate badass, and I, I agree. I know I know you're going to blush, but like, it, it, let, let's let's face it, you are a badass. Not only do you have a badass career in video games, this is the thing that I, the other thing I think many people don't know about you, but it's super cool. You were for eight years a professional race car driver. <laughs> I, um, I, yes, that is, that is true. Um, I was trying to qualify that in some way, but, um, it's true, but, um, you know, I, I grew up around cars. My father raced cars. Um, you know, as a kid, I was stuffed in the back of a 911, um, going to, to watch friends race at the racetrack. So it was kind of a really natural thing for me to be able to get into. And, um, you know, I, I love, I love speed. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite How could you not? Your name is Kiki Wolfkill. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no two ways around it. Like, yeah. If, if yeah. you didn't also have a career yeah. being like a race car driver or ask like, you know, space pilot, like something would be wrong. Yeah. Like, there was, there was never, there was never going to be like Kiki Wolfkill photocopy a repair person, right? Like it was just never going to happen. <laughs> you always had to do something super cool. Right. You, put... you sort of say you inherited the name, but like I, you, like you and the name manifested each other. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna put some images up on the screen here, Kiki. If you're monitoring the stream, you're gonna be a few seconds behind me, but I'll show you what we're looking at just in case. Um, okay. So, th so th here is an extremely cool uh, red racing car. Uh, is this a car that you uh, actually that you actually like raced on a on a track on a circuit? Yeah. So that um, so beyond the professional racing, I also have engaged in a few. This is semi legally sanctioned. This is the Cannonball One Lap of America um, event where you uh, you race different tracks and you have to get to the next track very quickly. So that's a Noble M400, amazing car. Um, uh, I didn't. Uh, it was an English car, so um, oh. I'll stereotype a little bit and say I didn't expect it to make it for the whole the whole event, but it did, and it was amazing. Um, I have never uh, driven uh, with so little sleep and food and all of the things you're supposed to drive on the track uh, with as that event, because you're literally driving like you know 600 miles, 800 miles in the middle of the night to get to the next track. It was awesome. I'm gonna I'm gonna very politely ignore the uh, the little swipe you just took there at the British automotive industry. Yeah, I know. And, uh, but there's a part of you inside, Gary, that's like, yeah, yeah, I kind of get it. Okay. I mean, when you, I mean, when you when you step into a Lotus or an Aston Martin, are you worried that it's going to be a, a piece of shit? Uh, no, you're right. <laughs> and I would never have classified the Noble as a piece of shit. Um, it was amazing, but you're right, and I. I really need an Aston Martin. It's, it's funny. I, it's funny. It's funny. I said I was going to ignore it, but then I like completely went at you over it. Here, here's you a very, here's, it. here's a, here's a very it. cool right. glamour. Here's a very cool glamour shot of what of you in what I'm. I'm. I'm not. I, I'm not like a big car guy, but this is this a Porsche that you're in right here. It is. It What's is. going on uh, here? It looks this like concept is, art. 
<laughs> I know this is, a, this is a little extreme. Um, this is how I look every day. This is my commute. I just took a selfie. Now. She's not lying. Um, no, <laughs> uh, that was, um, I think, uh, so I mentioned my father had raised, um, uh, Portia did a, uh, um, a, a big article on, on, on him, uh, a few years ago, um, cause he had owned a lot of Porsches and raced a lot of Porsches and, um, uh, his family got looped into it. So I think it's from that. This is one of my favorite, great. this is one of my favorite headshots of you in the, in the racing helmet. I love this one. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. yeah. I mean, like, um, there's, no, there's no cooler headshot than that. I should have put that on the promo post. Well, I mean, I mean honestly, I'm... what you need is, the, like, if you don't walk away from the Halo production with the shot of you in Master Chief's helmet like that, then... Oh, then I'm, I'm sure she's already got that in the bag. Uh, and, he, yeah. and, and and here's you, I think, with that same car in your, in your racing that game. That is the Noble. Yes, that is the Noble. Um, the fantastic English car that I knew was going to kick ass from the very beginning. Um, yeah, that was... Uh, that was sort of post formal racing career, and and that was just uh, shenanigans. Here's a, here's another one. What, what's what, is this? Uh, this looks like it's actually from your racing career. This one right here. That was that was that was a legitimate uh, uh, racing picture. So one of the one of the series I did was the the short lived but actually really effective women's global GT. Don Panos, who did the American Le Mans series, had set up a, a women's only series way back when, which. You know, you always go into those things with mixed feelings because you don't feel like you should have to have a, a women's only anything. But on the flip side, it was really hard at the time for women to get um, opportunities to get into professional racing. So it's sort of that double edged sword of um, it was it was an invaluable opportunity. Um, you wish you didn't need it, um, but it ended up being a ton of fun. It was it was awesome. Here you are, here you are actually racing that uh, that noble. What what is the fastest you've ever gone in a car? So I have to admit, the fastest I've ever gone in a car um, was as a passenger at Nurburgring in a in a oh, wow. uh, yeah a Carrera RS like original. Um, and uh, oh, actually no, that's not right. I'm sorry. It was a, a roof a 930 turbo roof Porsche. And we, uh, as a passenger, I was there with an ex -car uh, Porsche Cup driver, and we got up to like, you know, 220 or something literally ridiculous. Um, the fastest I've driven um, or gotten on a straightaway, ironically, has not been on the track because, you know, on a track, you're sort of limited by how long your, your, your straightaway is. And so I've gotten over 155 on the track, but up to 178 on the Autobahn. I knew you were going to say the Autobahn. I love it. <laughs> yeah. And I got one last shot here in this little slideshow. This one's adorable. Here's baby Kiki. Look at this. Look at this shot. Aww. <laughs> who's is this? Uh, who's this? Your that's big, my brother. That's your brother? My brother. Hell yeah! So yeah. I mean, you, and so so you obviously he, did grow yeah. up around a racing family. Here's you as yeah. a little, a little, yeah. little kid surrounded by that's racing amazing. stuff. Yeah, yeah. and that, he that, was. That uh, could be in a museum. That's incredible. Uh, he he uh, raced as well. He was the editor in chief for uh, Road and Track for a number of years. Oh wow! Um, I'm happy to have him back in Seattle. Um, we drove a lot together actually, um, because uh, endurance racing was kind of my my thing. And uh, so he and I drove a lot uh, together. We were we were actually a really strong team together. We are running really long this show. It's just because the show is so good and the guests are so good. Before we wrap up, Kiki, I do because you, know, you are here with your own Animal Crossing character. I love the custom the custom uh, hoodie that you're wearing. Tell me tell me about how Animal Crossing has been helping you through the. I'm sure it has as, as it has for so many of us been helping us through the lockdown through the quarantine. Tell me about what's going on on your Animal Crossing Island right now. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because um, I spent way too much time in Animal Crossing and, um, uh, well, the appropriate amount of time, which was all the time. Um, <laughs> and uh, and the last, I would say, probably three weeks is the biggest break I've taken. Uh, I'm still playing uh, every day. But, you know, there's there's so much going on out in the world right now. And, and you know, I'm in Seattle and... And there's a lot of um, sort of, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter conversations and, and, and protest activity and engagement. And I've been really actually focused on that for a few weeks. And so I kind of jumped back into Animal Crossing over the last, uh, uh, last week. Um, and it was a lovely respite. I mean, for me, it's just I love the um, sometimes I need a space I feel like I can really control. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 th I think you just summed up the essence of why the game is so popular right there. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so it was it was a welcome, welcome, 
um, opportunity to, co to come back to the game. So I was telling Jordan, I've stockpiled a ton of money um, and I am like, I have all these plans in my head for my island. I haven't done anything yet, but I, I have the means to do all that I want now. I'm excited about this summer update, swimming in the ocean. Yeah, right. That started today. Right? Uh, I think it's I think it's the day after tomorrow that it starts. Oh, all I know is I found an unusual bug today um, that I had never seen before. Oh, so. yeah, because I think they rotate new bugs in and out every month. But I think July yeah. 3rd is when they're dropping like all the big new features, the uh, swimming in the ocean. And oh, my God, I can't wait. <laughs> I know that Danny Trejo can't wait either. Um, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna start wrapping up now. I re remind I, I I I've screwed up on this recently because I kind of like like ambushed guests with it. I usually like to tell them edits. I'm like bring a joke. Do either of you or both of you have? We always ask our guests to step up to the microphone and tell a bad joke. D did you prepare one? Did you bring one? Are you willing to to uh, do a bit of stand up comedy at the mic here and tell it and tell a bad joke? Looks like Jordan is. Step not afraid this, of it. Step this way. Oh, step this way. Not afraid of ever telling bad jokes. Step right over here. All right, here we go. Here we go. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the comedy stylings of Jordan Vote Roberts. <laughs> um, how many hipsters does it take to screw in a light bulb? I don't know, Jordan. How many hipsters does it take to screw in a light bulb? It's an obscure number. You've probably never heard of it. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. Damn it! Your joke's already better than mine. Well, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll let the audience be the, the judge of that. We always put yeah. this to a, to an audience vote. Kiki, step right well, up. Someone told me to, to tell a joke about Switzerland. So hey, that's, my plan. that's that that's like our baseline joke. And and no and no and no, and no jokes about. I, I, like to, I like to shoot high. Please no jokes about dairy products because that's all Adam ever does. I don't know why, but all his jokes are about dairy products and not all of my jokes. Pretty much all of them. <laughs> all right. So no Switzerland, no dairy jokes. No what do you got? English what do you got? Cards. What do you got? We're ready for right. you. So why don't monkeys play poker in the jungle? I'm sorry. Can you say that again? Why don't monkeys play poker in the jungle? I don't know. Why don't monkeys play poker in the jungle? Because there are too many cheetahs. All right. Okay. All right. The poll, oh my god. Oh my god. The poll is is up. Uh if you if you look at the top of the chat there, you can vote for either Jordan or Kiki. It'll be up for the next 60 seconds. I encourage you uh to cast your vote and let's see who let's see who's going to win this comedy uh joke off. right now. Hold on. Oh, it's neck and neck. It's neck and neck. Kiki and I got grand plans. You can't, you can't try and divide it to be a bad joke. No, I, 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 I think this is going to bring you two closer together. Jordan, <laughs> Jordan, Jordan right now is edging it, 60, 61, 39%. I'm always I'm, edging. I, yeah. I, Jordan's I, I, joke I, is objectively better, I have uh, to say. I, I, liked, I liked them both. But, I think every, everyone's saying that they forgot Shaggy, and they seem to think that Shaggy's joke is like... Well, I, I, got, I mean, I got to say that Shaggy was the spiritual winner of the... of the, And we had a professional stand-up comic on the show, and Shaggy still won the day, I think, with that with that off-the-cuff <laughs> clutch comedy oh, save damn, that he pulled off. I was, was going to go sit in your chair, and you sat there. <laughs> no, one, no, no one else is allowed to sit in the chair, Jordan. I, know, I, I, was gonna, I don't have many rules on this show, but that's one of them. I was going to get back there. Do you, I mean, you know what, Jordan? Because I like you, would, would, you, would you like to... To come sit in the host chair. Oh boy, I don't know if I can what? take that on. Kiki, you can. You, you know what? Gotta, it's season two. So it's couch. season two. <laughs> Who cares? I think Kiki is preventing you from can... getting off the couch right yeah. now. <laughs> oh yeah, that's because I'm changing my outfit. Wait, look. All right. Okay. Okay. Oh, I like I like the Pride Xbox logo oh, yeah. that you're wearing there as yeah. well. That's very cool. All right. Okay. okay. Who wants to sit in the chair? I'm, I'm going to regret this. I'm going to regret this. I know it. Oh my God. Will you put that away, Adam? Oh, and there's a fish. I'm, lose, I'm starting to lose control of the show. Yes, I'm stuck. <laughs> hey, Jordan, did, did you instantly feel like power when you sat in that chair? It's like sitting in Palpatine's oh, throne. Bring, bring that giant fish back out. That is such a, I got to take a picture of this. Okay. That is okay. such a, uh, and Kiki, bring your wand out. Okay. Wait, I'm changing out. I've got my okay, hair off. fish. Where's the giant fish? Oh, I like the dress. Yeah. Oh, it's pretty. Is that a, is that a custom design? There we go. There we go. Oh now, my God. It's, now it's now it's Get, get, that, thing, get that thing away from it. me. That's, that's, what I, that's what I said. Yeah. It just turns in. This is this is my wife in a nutshell right now. Kiki just <laughs> brought, Kiki brought like a whole oh. wardrobe of awesome outfits. I love it. I did. <laughs> I did. This is the baton. The baton. Oh, I like. Oh, that's really cute. I like that. Look at that. It's like high end. <laughs> that well, one of the fall. I mean, now. If I did my job correctly, and I'm not saying I did, there's a good chance I didn't. You should have received during your uh, uh, previous visit to the set uh, a gift from the show. 
Do, do, yes, do, do, do you want me giving you a wrapped gift? Yeah. Yes, yes. I would like to invite you to unwrap that now on the show. It says I can't use the item. Uh, you should be able to unwrap it at least. I did unwrap it. It says, it says ah. uh, raccoon figurine. Yes, it's the worst item in the game. Uh, <laughs> it's that, that the ugly ass raccoon that's sitting at the back of the, the set there it. next to the jukebox. You you now own that. Please take <laughs> please take it with the compliments of the show. I love it. I love it. All right, Gary. I have to admit that um, you gave it to me earlier and told me not to do anything with it. And then I opened it by accident. So then I had to oh wait till like, I could put the wrapping paper again and then wrap it up like you like I'd never opened. You it. and Elijah would. You just can't. You just can't resist <laughs> unwrapping gifts ahead of time. So wait, so you re you rewrapped it? Just just okay. That's yeah. very that's very sweet I, of you. I had to wait till I could. All right. Buy I would like wrap. to invite you now to unwrap it again and pretend to be surprised at what's inside. <laughs> There you go. Thank you very much. Now, Hello. you should also have been given uh, party poppers. I have one right here. Do you have your party right. poppers? Do you yeah. have your party poppers? <laughs> this was a British thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you have your party poppers? Excuse me, sir. <laughs> May I borrow a party popper? <laughs> now, before, before we blow those off, um <laughs> by the way by the way okay st even though the show's coming to an end stick around because we always raid a small streamer at the end of the show and it's really fun to go raid them we love doing that so we'll do that at the end of the credits here we also have all new closing credits a new a new uh, end credits theme uh composed by kenny fong and performed by kenny fong and his band the same guy who did our opening title theme uh has actually uh Give, uh, given us an all new closing end credits theme that I'm very excited to debut on the show uh, tonight. We'll be doing that in just a moment. First of all, let me give you a little glimpse of next week's show. You're going to like this. Uh, we've, I think we've got a really good one coming up next week, next Wednesday night, July 8th. Um, Simu Liu, the newest, latest star of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the guy who's going to play Shang Si uh, in the in the uh, MCU, will be joining us on Animal Talking. He's going to bring. He's a big Animal Crossing player. He's bringing his character to the island next week. Shannon Woodward, of course, uh, star of Westworld, and uh, obviously right now a big deal because she's uh, plays one of the main characters in The Last of Us Part Two will be on the show and musical guest Sean Wasabi will also be on the show uh, bringing some tracks from his latest album and he'll also be uh, performing and we're very, very excited about that. So that's next week's show, uh, July 8th, 7 p.m., Pacific, uh, and we've got some amazing, amazing guests. We're actually all we're fully booked all through the month of July. We've got some amazing guests coming up through the rest of the month that I can't wait to uh, uh, reveal uh, to you. But uh, for right now, let's like again. My, my guests are so wonderful, and they've, they've got their party poppers ready. I see Adam is ready to go as well. I would invite you all to please uh, pull off your party poppers on the count of three. One, two, three. Give your party poppers. Aww. Yes, your party poppers. <laughs> Party I can poppers. I can American it up for you. Yeah. Let's get your party poppers. Like I can I can do it like American style. You don't, you don't want to hear that. You don't really want to hear that. I um, like your American accent. No, nobody really likes it. Nobody it's really likes good. it. I'm gonna mute the jukebox because we're gonna get the credits rolling here. Um. Oh my goodness. What a what a what an incredible show. Um. To all my, to all my guests. To uh to to Shaggy, uh Jimmy O Yang, Jordan Vote Roberts. And of course, uh, Kiki Wolfkill and everyone who helps make the show possible. Uh, Adam Nickerson, my wonderful wife and executive producer, Leah Witter, stage manager, Kate Stark, all of our moderators. We love our mods. Please get some mod love emotes in the chat. I'm going to invite you all to spin around as the credits are playing. We'll see you all here again next week. But for right now, for me and everyone at Animal Talking, thank you and good night. <laughs> I Thank just want to play the ground in real life with party poppers. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah, Kiki in real life was play basically like. Uh, Flashlight tag or like capsule flag, but it's yeah. amazing with a party pop flashy. Yeah. Yeah.